All right. How are we all? Just in time, a little bit early, actually. Uh, who made that background animation? That was me. It took me about 20 minutes. Just playing around randomly, and uh, I found some filters that made an infrared animation of the weather, I guess, look really cool. So I did that. I blew it up a little bit. I put some filters over it. I added in some stuff, and there it is. It's actually really easy to do. But I like the... Uh, I like the outcome. How are you? Got any rest? Um, I got a little bit of rest. I slept in pretty late. Granted, I was streaming until like 5 a.m. How many cardigans do you have? I want to say uh, 10, but one of them I'm not sure if it counts. All right. Oh, so we will not be going till 5 a.m. tonight uh, because I will die. Um, but we are going to cover something decently long. So I'm hoping that doesn't go for too long. If it's depending on how it is, I may just pop in dead space through it if I can watch it passively. But we'll see. It, it might be one of those things that's that's you know really engaging and and just keeps our attention on it. If it's just pain, then it's pain. It's crowd, so it's hit or miss. That last stream was absurd. That last stream, that was a ride. Um, I I don't know what to make of that. I I don't know. People have told me Cherry isn't usually vapid. Um, she seemed like one of the most empty people I've ever encountered. Which is par for the course in this space, but it's usually not that apparent. Well, in any case, I suppose it's time. Now I'm wondering... I just got sent this by Doe, and it's 15 minutes long, and we are a few minutes late, so I wonder if we can get away with going over this quickly. Um, I haven't looked at it yet, but apparently Vosh was called out on the transgenocide thing. I want to know what side he was called out on, because that's interesting for various reasons. Then we can jump right into the crowd stuff. All good? You drank an entire bottle of wine to get through that. That is very unhealthy. Take it from me. If that's too much for me, it's too much for you. Good rule of thumb. It was a fundraising stream for my channel. Felt like it. People really wanted me to keep that going for some reason. Anyway, so uh, before we get into the good stuff, uh, we're going, which will be uh, Kraut's critique of realism, which I'm I'm both excited and concerned about. Uh, Vosh got called out, in all caps, on David Pakman's show about his trans genocide takes. Well. Caller, Vosh is calling anti-trans bills genocide from the David Pakman show. That is true. I, I do say this. What's up? Next to Casey. Good. I was concerned it was the other side. Casey from Kansas. Casey from Kansas, welcome to the program. Let's hope and pray for no technical issues. Casey, welcome. You're on. Oh, dear. Casey, the most likely problem is you've selected an audio device that's not valid on your computer. That's true. Hello? Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Oh, uh, you can? Sorry, it took me a second. What's so, going on? I had a question relating to something that's been asked in a few of the communities I'm in recently. Okay. Mainly the Vosh or Vouch community. Is Ian Vouch, of course. Yes, Ian Vouch. But would you consider the legislation 
and the rhetoric from the GOP targeting trans people to be a genocide in any sense of the word. Uh, okay, so just really quickly, because people keep playing this um, semantic game, I want to make it clear that um, as a linguistic uh, descriptivist, okay, I, I really don't care that much about the idea of like the sanctity of a definition. The problem that I have here is that it seems like like the term concentration camp, this is something that you can use to refer to an incredibly wide range of actions. And if you abide by some definitions, it makes sense. And if you abide by some colloquial definitions, it doesn't. So for instance, uh, the border camps that Trump maintained, and let's be fair, to an extent, Biden maintains still, to, to a lesser extent, but yeah, still, uh, meet the definition of a concentration camp with like detainment and like political purposes and the whole thing, you know? It, it meets, and Obama, yes, and, and going a while back, it meets the definition of a concentration camp. But when I said that, like two, three years ago, when this was active ongoing discourse, there were a lot of conservatives who were like, well, no, a concentration camp is like Auschwitz. It's like a death camp. And it's, okay, we do tend to call Auschwitz a concentration camp, but the main thing that made Auschwitz significant was that it was a death camp. Concentration camps are not actually that uncommon the world around, unfortunately. Death camps are. Thank thankfully, they're a lot rarer. So a, a concentration camp is like a, it's a broader term. I mean, we did them back in World War II with the, uh, uh, the Japanese internment camps. Those were undeniably concentration camps. Uh, here, if we just, hold on. Concentration camp definition. That's, that's how we go. We go to the Google definition, like all wise political YouTubers. A place where large numbers of people, especially political prisoners or members of persecuted minorities, are deliberately imprisoned in a relatively small area with inadequate facilities, sometimes to provide forced labor or await mass, uh, mass execution. The term is most strongly associated with Nazi Germany, so on and so forth. Uh, it says sometimes to provide forced labor or await mass uh, execution, but if all you're getting from this is a place where large numbers of people, especially political prisoners or members of persecuted minorities, are deliberately imprisoned in a small area with inadequate facilities, that would describe, like, a lot of places, you know? that uh, that's, It's not that uncommon. It's really only one step further along than a regular American prison, to be honest. The Uyghur Muslims in China? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. 100%. Yeah. Anyway, so the point here being, like, if your definition of genocide is, like, killing them all, then, like, yeah, obviously that hasn't happened yet. Um, but there are definitions of genocide that involve, like, the, um, the absolute social exclusion of a group or an effort to bring about conditions uh, unlivable in nature for a group of people. Uh, and I think the reason a lot of people don't like to think about that is because they don't like thinking about genocide as an unexceptional thing. And what I mean by that is, by this definition, uh, Reagan failing to address the AIDS crisis back in the 80s, unquestionably a, a genocidal act on his part. Literally, like, let's let this disease ravage the gay population because they're being punished by God for their degeneracy and we're just going to abet and aid that death, you know? That's pretty unambiguously, you know, I don't know how you could argue that isn't true. I just think a lot of people don't like to think of it that way. I think a lot of people like to think it's like, okay, genocide is when Holocaust, concentration camp is when Holocaust, everything is when Holocaust. Bosch, so it's more semantically correct to say lead up to a genocide, but more rhetorically effective to just say genocide. Well, if, if, you're de if genocide begins, like, the moment people start, like, getting shot, then it, we aren't currently in a genocide. If, if you could say, like, this overwhelming push from Republicans all across the country, this unprecedented wave of anti-trans legislation, which is absolutely an effort to just remove them from society. Like, that process is genocidal. That would be what I would say. Like, in this case, we're dealing with, like, a legalistic second-class citizen kind of genocide, where the goal is to use, like, legal separation and legal distinction to uh, bring about unlivable conditions for a group of people. And in, in that... If I'm not commenting, he's basically correct. There's nothing to say yet. ...sense, I would say that the laws that are currently being fought for by the GOP are genocidal. But again, like, you notice how little information we're getting out of actually debating the semantics here? Uh, I, I would be much more interested in saying, like, yeah, these are genocidal laws. It's like, okay, well, why are they genocidal laws? Ah, because they're looking to bring about the unlivable conditions and so on and so forth. You know, look at this, look at that, da, da, da. And then you, like, move from there. But if we acknowledge that genocide has, like, a f ton of different definitions, then obviously there's room for disagreement on the specific use case. It, it seems like a lot of people just in bad faith want to, like, banty it about. Anyway, sorry, I'm just pausing here. Um, the caller's maybe not acting bad. I don't know anything about the caller, so. You know, these these things are so fraught because you can you can contrive and fabricate some interpretation of so many things where you could match it up with a number of different words, like, for example, genocide speaking colloquially. And I know, Casey, you're not trying to gotcha me, right? So just like speaking colloquially. I don't think that those are the right words that I would apply to the anti trans legislation. Now, can I like can I imagine how someone might make that connection? Can I propose to you how I would do it if I wanted to make that case? You tell me if this is what's being said. Casey. Hello. Damn, he blew that guy the fuck out. Holy shit. Uh, hi. OK. 
Can you hear me, Casey? Yeah, a little bit. I was having a little bit of trouble. Okay. But yeah, I think I can hear you. If I had to make the case that anti-trans legislation is genocide, I would say something like the following. Um, trans folks have a high rate of suicide uh, attempting and suicidal ideation. And when you pass anti-trans bills that make it more difficult for them to avail themselves of the medical or other services that may help them, you increase the odds that they will attempt suicide. And thus, one could argue that those bills are, in a sense, a genocide. Is, is that like roughly the way one would do it? Is that how I actually disagree with that line. For me, actually, the root of it would be in bathroom bills. That was where this all started. And I think that might have been like where this is going. Like, that's kind of the end point, right? So. Uh, the, the, the bathroom bills, like the whole, you have to use your biological bathroom, you use your biological porcelain toilet bowl or whatever. The idea there, I think, is actually one of the most sort of um, fundamentally genocidal because it completely precludes trans people from existing in a public space. Most bathrooms are gender separated publicly, meaning that if you introduce legislation that could lead to them being arrested if they use the restroom they want to use, but then you whip up a big like anti-trans moral panic that increases the likelihood of them being assaulted if they use the bathroom the state says they should use. The truth is that they're just not going to use public restrooms. And that sounds like a trivial thing, but, and I understand this may come across as a bit hyperbolic, but I fully mean it. We have to understand how much like removal from public uh, faculties was a component of Jim Crow era segregation. Uh, there's a lot of weight socially to going like, okay, these institutions, these banal, everyday, ordinary human institutions uh, that everyone else takes for granted, you don't get to use them. Not just because it's circumstantially difficult, the way it might be for, say, a disabled person, where there's just maybe some physical difficulty in using them. That's unfortunate, but uh, it's also kind of a component of the disability. No, in this case, the state is deliberately, for no reason, removing them from that space. And to, to, that, to my mind, that just reminds me more of the logic behind segregation. I mean, not to mention, we've talked about this on stream. You guys have been seeing this, right? Like DeSantis, uh, uh, um, like threatening to arrest teachers who have gender ideology in their classrooms, whether it be in books in the library or in the classroom or, or anything that's said, you know, opening up teachers to being like scrutinized by insane boomer right wing parents, uh, if, if ever they say anything remotely progressive on, on gender or sexual issues like, uh, uh, oh, um, uh, the, the laws recently to ban, I forget which state to ban um, drag performances to put them in the same category as like pornography. Obviously, when Republicans draft this legislation, it's not really just targeted at drag Oklahoma. It's targeted at any kind of like gender divergent behavior. Keep in mind, it wasn't that long ago that in, say, New York City, the police could arrest you for deviance if you were wearing three articles of clothing that, quote, didn't belong to your gender. So if you can, so we, have, we have precedent for this stuff, you know. Now, technically, that doesn't, that, that law doesn't mention trans people, right? Like that, that like hundred year old law or whatever, it doesn't say like, yeah, if you're trans, we'll arrest you. But, you know, three articles of clothing that are the other gender, like, we know what this actually means, don't we? We're not dumb. I would consider what I'm talking about here Considering the fact that it's part of a deliberate state orchestrated effort to specifically target one minority group, I can comfortably call that a genocide. I'm okay with it. Like, I, I think I can defend that just fine. Because the definition, again, can include, like, an effort to bring about in whole or in part, like, an unlivable, like, a, like a, an unlivable state of affairs to, to, to make life just unlivably difficult for a group of people. I mean, Donald Trump was literally just saying, federally ban all trans healthcare and all gender ideology. Or like, or okay, like, I don't think there's anything really here for me to comment on. I think he's basically correct. Um, there's nothing really controversial here to my ears, at least. We can just jump right into the uh, crowd stuff. Although I'm glad uh, Doe sent me this because uh, it's reminded me that I need to get on finishing up the trans genocide uh, history videos. Stuff piled up so hard. Anyways, so this is Kraut, a critique of realism. I've uh, made video critiques of realism and neorealism before um i have uh what did i call that video again hang on i forgot the title of my own video one moment so if i look on my channel yes how international relations theory misinterpret misrepresents reality i need to retitle that um yeah I, I, you know what i'm gonna do actually i know a good title the ideology of international relations theory yeah, I like that one. We'll go with that one. Let's let's do that. I'll just retitle it very quickly. The ideology of international. Let's go. Let's just go with international relations. That works. I need to. I need to pick normal titles that people can recognize. All right. So this is uh, Kraut's critique of realism. Does he have any? Uh, Citations here. My friend Frog made this excellent video critiquing realism that I can recommend to you all as well. I see. What is it? Rationality, cooperation, Putin, and the security of others. Re-uploaded for sensitive ears. That that was not for sense. Oh, I see. Wait, for sensitive ears? That was almost deafening. 
I don't know who this person is. Let's take a look at him, actually. Two versions of this. Uh, nature of nationalism. Comparing violence and democracy and totalitarian... Ooh, I don't like that one. Let's take a look at this. Nature of nationalism. This is Violence in the West Part 2, Nationalism. As an introduction, George Orwell once said that every nationalist is haunted. <sighs> Sources, Benedict Anderson, Imagine Communities, George Orwell, Notes on Nationalism. Okay, that's not, that's not super well cited, but we can judge that on its own merits later. Kraut's Critique of national uh, Realism. Sorry, let's get into it. This video is a critique of the foreign policy school of realism, which recently got a lot of attention in the news media because international relations school of realism, not not foreign affairs. Because of the war in Ukraine. Did you say foreign affairs? This, this video is a critique of the foreign policy school of realism, which school school recently realism. got a lot of attention in the news media because of the war in Ukraine. Many prominent realists, such as John Mersheimer, and yeah, and international realism is is a or a realism rather is is a school of international relations theory. It's not a school of uh foreign policy i mean i guess it i guess it could be depends on who you mean henry kissinger have been giving talks and writing articles since then advocating for an end of western support for ukraine the injection of political opinions in the news is something we're increasingly aware of but it can be difficult to navigate which is why i'm a big fan of ground news this oh my god we need to petition the hospitals to end their support of kissinger Need to make another one like it. There's a video that a lot of you requested for a very long time, critiquing realism, Merzheimer and Chomsky, and here you go. This is it, but uh, it's a bit of a longer one, so get comfortable. When Russia invaded Ukraine, many people began sharing clips of John Merzheimer, in particular far-left pundits who are critical of an interventionist American foreign policy, which is somewhat funny, but more on that later. Merzheimer argues in these clips that the fault of the war in Ukraine lies with the Americans for creating an existential threat for Russia by advancing the borders of NATO. Merzheimer has also been invited to several discussions after the Russian invasion to speak. Merzheimer is a realist, and it is important to outline here what realism is. I will try to do so objectively, but you are free to point- All right, I'm popping in dead space. This is going to be a slog. I already know where this is going. This is going to be- Oh boy, this is going to be rough, guys. That's okay. Here, let's pull this up. volume down who wants to write a manifesto with me you writing a manifesto what are you writing a manifesto about and why are you writing a manifesto in 2023 all right yeah yeah we know we're all very proud of you for making the game Just to the point. bring the audio down all right, that's that. And we go back here and we click here, here. Hey, wait, wait. There, and boom doubt in the comments if I fail at that. Realism is not an idealistic position or a set of ideological beliefs. Realism is something completely different. Realism is a school of international studies in which people attempt to create a system of analysis that allows for predictive models of analysis of geopolitical developments despite one's biases. It strives to create an objective framework from which to interpret geopolitics. And although I will argue against this claim to objectivity, I will present realism as faithfully as I can. Realism is a method of seeing and analyzing geopolitics and not something driven out of any sort of idealism or higher-minded morality. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Realism seeks to ground itself through free guiding principles. That men are self-interested and power-seeking, and therefore that ethics and 
what ought to be, are not good tools to make or predict state policy, and that their natural condition is a state of anarchy in many ways, shapes and forms, realism has existed for a very long time. In order to justify their starting assumptions, realists often make an appeal to human nature and in particular to history. One such example is Thucydides' famous account of oh. the War, which Thucydides describes as the confrontation between a honor-bound and, in principle, idealist Sparta with the strongest land army against Athens, the sea power, with a practical and cynical approach to diplomacy and war who distinctly argue that morality has never triumphed over self-interest. Okay, so I... I th fuck, I know. There is a common thread in a lot of really bad international relations theory that will try to draw some kind of canonical or, I guess, thematic uh, genealogy back to Thucydides through Machiavelli, through Hobbes. Um, this, this is BS, uh, principally because the main thing that defines uh, realism and in international relations theory is the idea, uh, there's a million different variants of this, but is the idea that fundamentally at bottom, international relations, the relation, global politics or politics between communities is fundamentally a situation in which you have uh, ordered discrete states with, at some level of conception, an inside and an outside. There is that which is within the state and that which is without the state, and the states act as agents and they have interests and they have all these different characteristics of individuals, which is why you have parity between the state of nature in human beings, a la Hobbes, and the international state of anarchy, um, wherein you have, well, outside of states, there is no higher power, therefore, states sort of float like cells in a petri dish. Uh, you remember cell stage from, um, from a spore, where all of these little, like, creatures are just eating each other, and that's the entire world? That's, that's the international, uh, uh, anarchy that's being referred to here um not actually really what happens in thucydides this is a really uh a really reductive reading of thucydides that simplifies him down a lot um but we can uh we can ignore that for now um i've spoken at length about some of the problems of treating uh especially given like the incursion of non-polis entities like, for example, the Persian king and his forces, etc., etc., the incursion of, of sort of cultural, soft cultural forces, like the, the fear of medianism, stuff like that. Um, there isn't really any correlation between what happens in the Peloponnesian War and what happens, say, uh, in foreign policy decisions, uh, about like perspective threat of China, say. And one of the big dangers here is that because international relations theorists often reduce all these things to a very simple scheme of just states as agents just vying for their own self-interest against each other, like they're they're in a game, um, is that you you take rules and patterns that you've incorrectly uh, you've incorrectly adduced from one set of circumstances radically different from yours and you've brought them over to ours so there's a um a book called thucydides trap it's by uh something ellison i can't remember his name um but he he takes this idea that because thucydides talks about the growing uh greatness the growing power in his translation which i believe is this one damn i gotta dust my shelf again uh, the uh, Landmark Thucydides, which is the translation by oh, what's his name again? Begins with a C. Begins with a C. Translation by yeah, you're very. I'm so proud of you, Strasser, for editing this. But why on earth do you not have the translator's name on the front? Crawley, that's it. Richard Crawley translation. Um, he translates it as the. Uh, the growing power of Athens, if memory serves, or growing strength, or something like that. And as a consequence, um, some contemporary theorists have taken that to mean, well, the growing military strength of a state can be a trigger for war. It's like a, a law of nature or something. It's actually really silly when you think about it, because people are making decisions and judgments, but they treat it as if this is inevitable, because it's 
kind of cool and now easy to predict if it's inevitable. That's it's it's a very sexy thing to be able to just predict the future that way by means of a simple uh, well pattern recognition. Um, but the problem is that the translation is faulty because what's actually referred to is not the growing strength of Athens, but the growing greatness of Athens. Um, Sparta wasn't afraid of, uh, Athens building up its triremes and just getting, you know, the best top of the line spears. Um, they were concerned about the growing influence of Athens, its growing number of allies, uh, the growing influence of democratic ideology, et cetera, et cetera. And that's... That's what compelled them to go to war with Athens. It was not the, it was not just the military strength of Athens because they were actually fairly well matched. Um, however, people like Ellison and Xi Jinping himself um, have actually directly referenced. I mean, Ellison has clearly because he wrote the book *The City's Trap*. But Xi Jinping is actually known to have read some version of the. Uh, some version of Thucydides derived from the Crawley translation, and he has actually talked about Thucydides' trap before, which means that a mistranslation is actually informing really deadly elements of foreign policy right now. That's one of the big problems with the way in which uh, realist international theorists uh, like Mearsheimer, um, that's that's one of the serious problems with with them reducing everything to a, a an easily uh, an easily encapsulated gamification, I guess, of, of something that is just much more complicated and much more multifaceted. And they'll make these grandiose uh, prescriptions on the basis of these really, really simplistic analyses. Um, Mearsheimer's uh, uh, de facto apologia for the Russian invasion of Ukraine is, is actually laughable. Um, if you're capable of scrutinizing the theoretical bases which he uses as an alibi for it. And superior strength. Debates over ideas, although fictional, litter the history of the Peloponnesian War, which is why it was not simply interpreted as an account of historical facts, but as the start of a theoretical work. Nowhere is this more evident no. than in the Melian Dialogues, in which Athenians seek to capture the small, inconsequential, independent Spartan colony on the Greek island of Melos. I will leave a link to it in the description, as it is a really good read and helps understand, and I'll do a recording of it with a friend, for those of you who are too lazy to read, so you can listen to it. The link will be in the description. The Melians, though militarily weak, do not wish to stray from the ideal that they have the right to be an independent and self-organized polity, and believe that the gods and their allies... Look, here's the thing, right? This is what's really crucial to keep in mind. The Peloponnesian War is longer than just a million dialogue. <laughs> the, the Athenians uh, lose decisively at the end. Um... This is not a rule. This is not Thucydides saying this is how the world works. This is how you should actually like determine and judge like what is a good idea or what you ought to do. He's he's describing the actions of only one player in in this whole ensemble. And he he does not characterize the Athenians as wise or prudent, quite the opposite. Um if anything he has a much kinder appraisal of the Spartans than he does of the Athenians will come to their aid so that what is right and fair may triumph. The Athenians, on the other hand, seek to convince them to face the facts and surrender rather than face their extinction and make the point that Athens we'll must conquer them as a show of strength, lest it be thought of as weak. Because the Athenians are animated by the purpose of power, which seems to force their hand just for its own sake. In the end, Melos refuses to surrender and all men of military age are killed and the rest sold into slavery in one inconsequential skirmish of the war. I personally like using Machiavelli's The Prince to explain reason, ah. written in a time when Italy was dominated by city-states, ruled by princes who vied for power and dominance over Italy. Machiavelli wrote that a good ruler cannot be driven by ideals, in particular those of the domineering religious morality, but must engage in the struggles of competing Italian city-states through hard-boiled calculations of what benefits the city-state's position. The prince, in order to succeed, has to therefore engage in actions and policies that may be deemed as morally objectionable or even outright evil. But such objections based on ideals and conceptions of morality are a pointless slideshow, a distraction from success in the game of power. The means, 
therefore justify the ends. In no. The but it would what? also be a grave Wait. misconception to present... What? The, what? Hang on. ...its position. The prince, in order to succeed, has to therefore engage in actions and policies that may be deemed as morally objectionable or even outright evil. But such objections based on ideals and conceptions of morality are a pointless slideshow, a distraction from success in the game of power. The means... Therefore, justify the ends, in a way. But it would also be a grave misconception to present the realist school as what- I don't know what he's- I don't know what he's talking about. It sounded for a second like he was describing, uh, sort of like the kind of virtue ethics approach to, I guess, the well, Aristotelian approach to virtue. Where, here are these qualities you want to maximize and they're good for their own sake. And even if you lose, you won't be miserable. Whereas Machiavelli talks about virtu, V-I-R-T-U, without an E. Um, where really what it is, is these are the qualities of character that allow you to court fortuna in time to like make, make sharp and, and prudent judgments to know when to act, when not to act, et cetera, et cetera. It's like the difference between, uh, I don't know, Gus Fring and Jesse Pinkman. One of people endlessly justifying bloodthirsty conquests and conquerors. There are many historical figures and events that realists like to study as a foundation of interpreting modern geopolitics, and that includes most notably peacemaking. One example is the Napoleonic Wars, in which realists disregard. Although, lest we forget, Jesse Pinkman's the one who survives Breaking Bad. At Napoleon, and instead praise Metternich. Napoleon, from the realist perspective, is someone who destabilized the balance of European powers, where each one could more or less keep the others in check. He did so by driving French territory and sister republic buffer states deep into Italian, Austro-Hungarian and Russian lands, thereby turning them all against France in coalitions that he could not hope to defeat. Metternich, however, is often regarded by many realists to be an ideal guideline of how to conduct foreign policy. Through hard-boiled calculations, ruthless power politics, the creation of an integrated okay. network of alliances, taking account for the spheres of influence of others while not losing sight of one's own aspirations, Metternich, the de facto ruler of Imperial Austria, despite his country losing the most battles of the Napoleonic Wars, managed to guide the Austrian Empire to coming out on top at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, gaining new territories, securing and expanding its sphere of influence, and making it one of the most powerful powers in Europe despite its internal problems, and most of all, creating a system of power distribution, called the Concert of Europe, where every power was so expertly balanced against each other that there would be no major European war for almost a century. Bismarck is another historic figure that realists have much admiration for. His cold and ruthless application of power politics is famous, playing games of power and influence with Austria, Denmark, France and the German states, carefully playing them out against each other, always careful to not overextend and be in a state in which he would be outnumbered by enemies, and transforming Prussia into a German empire not for an offensive war of conquest, but rather by defensively unifying them against the French in a union so lasting it became its own state. We can learn more by looking at a historical figure for which realists have a lot of scorn and hold up as the worst type of geopolitical leader, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Because a core foundation of realism is not just an advocacy of cold, hard-boiled power politics with the intention of becoming the strongest power on earth. There may not be rules to game of power politics, but there are limitations and these limitations are determined by the other players in the game. And if these players can't become the most powerful players, they will go for the second best thing, their own security and existence. As Hegel said, the state has no higher duty than of maintaining itself. Kaiser Wilhelm disregarded these other players, as well as their aspirations and spheres of influence. He managed to threaten simultaneously the French with the Agadir and Tangier crisis, the British with the building of the high seas fleet, and the Russians with the unconditional backing of Austria-Hungary, sacking three great powers against him for the price of a single dysfunctional alliance with Austria that was based more on misguided ideals rather than by geopolitical calculations, and another with the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire. In the end, from the realist perspective, Kaiser Wilhelm, who did not appreciate the limitations that were set by other players in the game of powers, managed to unite all the other power players against him and lost what Bismarck had built. So take note of this, because this is something that many fail to understand about realism. This is consistent with um, a lot of realism, uh, just the approach, not the content here, I I'm not really certain of that. But the, um, the approach of realism is often to rely on a really reductive read of past historical situations 
and to treat these as if they um, are indicative of like steady and stable rules. They're not. This is again one of the reasons why realism is actually much more idealistic than what they call, I mean, what's sometimes disparagingly called um, an idealistic approach to international relations. It doesn't really exist. Um, but this is realism is not really all that realist in fact in the in the classical sense realism is not an instruction manual on how to gain unlimited power and influence based on an unrestrained application of power in geopolitics realism also argues for restraint Realism argues that powers must appreciate that other powers also play the game of power. Realism argues that one should calculate one's geopolitical decisions or foreign policy in appreciation of those informal limitations set by other powers, to put oneself in their shoes before thinking to act to gain advantage, lest you lock each other in an inefficient and avoidable conflict. This very part is a weakness of the realist school. My friend Frog did a very good video presenting that weakness and he helped me somewhat with this video, so I will leave a link to his okay. video in the description here too. All For right. my outline on realism, I'm going to use the author Hans Morgenthau, who is one of the founding thinkers of modern realism as a school of international relations and geopolitics. This is not- Okay, okay, this is- Okay, the picture you're seeing right now is- Wait, did he refer to it as Matt Cat's analysis? efficient and avoidable conflict. This very part is a weakness of the realist school. My friend Frog did a very good video presenting that weakness, and he helped me somewhat with this video, so I will leave a link to his video in the description here too. For my outline on realism, I'm going to use the author Hans Morgenthau, who is one of the founding thinkers okay, of more than... Okay, okay, look, Kraut, buddy. I know you can't get, like, new, nice new copies of Hans Morgenthau's Politics Among Nations anymore. It's basically out of print. That is not... The cover of Politics Among Nations. That is a, a, a little Cliff Notes edition that talks about it. That's not the same thing. I oh god damn it. I think we need to look at this other video first. I think I think our hands are tied. I think we have to. Well, let's take a look at it. Еще в 2008 году Россия выдвинула инициативу о заключении договора о европейской безопасности. Смысл его состоял в том, чтобы ни одно государство, ни одна международная организация в Евроатлантике не могли бы укреплять свою безопасность за счет безопасности других. <coughs> Могу здесь сослаться и на хартию европейской безопасности ОБСЕ 1999 года, принятую в Стамбуле, и на Астанинскую декларацию ОБСЕ 2010 года. Другими словами, выбор способов обеспечения безопасности не должен создавать угрозы для других государств. В Киеве давно провозгласили стратегический курс на вступление в НАТО. Да, безусловно, каждая страна имеет право выбирать собственную систему обеспечения безопасности, заключать военные союзы. И все вроде бы так, если бы не так, но в международных документах прямо зафиксирован принцип... Uh, what have we got? Graham Priest Rational Dilemmas. Uh, Robert Jervis Cooperation with the Security Dilemma. There's no critical material here, I'm noticing. Maybe Rationality and International Relations. Graham Priest. Okay, let's see. Um, the Prisoner's Dilemma and the Limits of Rationality. PD applied to IR. Let's just go from here, from 4 to 13 minutes in. I think that's what we want to look at. For the purposes of this video, I want to present two schools of the neo-realist current of international relations. First, there are is the defensive realists, the good guys, who believe that states long for security and that this quest for security will bring forward a situation of balance of power, and thus that conflict has situational causes as opposed to structural ones. That conflicts are accidents of fate, so to speak, and not predestinated events. That's the school that Robert Jervis, our author, belongs to. The other school of thought, offensive realists, founded by John Mersheimer, believes the opposite, 
that states will naturally attempt to achieve hegemony over others in pursuance of that security goal, which is actually a hegemony goal, and thus that conflicts are inevitability. That school of thought is made up of evil Germans, and that automatically disqualifies it from any further references. For real. As an actual belief, I have to say it's quite a low bar to sink to, even for paradox game players. It shows terrible character. To get back to our guy, Jervis tries to explain how conflicts are- That's a weird sentence. He's correct. But that's a weird sentence. ...are always products of their respective eras through the concept of security dilemmas. A security dilemma is basically a take on the famous prisoner's dilemma. You must know the drill. Already two prisoners are simultaneously presented with the choice of ratting the other out okay, look, or remaining... Here's the fundamental problem with realist schools, just in general, of, of international relations. You cannot apply a prisoner's dilemma in this case because you are not dealing with two rational agents with a strict inside and outside. You're not dealing with individuals. Um, you're you're not even dealing with uh, really with single states in any given case. You're not dealing with um, anything that has a, a. There's no sharp distinction between the inside of a state and the outside of a state. And the notion of sovereignty, certainly at the individual state level, is purely fictional. This one was invented by a writer. Being silent. And the outcome that they both keep silent, they will get light sentences, one year each. Should one betray the other and rat him out, then he will be rewarded with freedom, while the other one rots in jail for three years. But if both attempt to betray the other, they will both end up with two years each. The worst possible combined jail time. We call the two options they have C and D for cooperate and defect. For a given prisoner, we can describe... Any is that how IR works for Doomed? Look at my video, which I just renamed the Ideology of International Relations. That is actually how IR works. It's super reductive. Reductive to the point of insanity. It's one of the most impoverished schools of political science. I wouldn't even really consider it political science personally, but that's uh, not a generally accepted view. But it's the right view. The outcome of the game with those two letters. By convention, let's say the first letter describes what a given prisoner does and the second, what his opponent does. Taking, for example, prisoner A, his preferred outcomes are in order DC, CC, DD, and CD, which give him respectively zero, one, two, and three years of jail time. In short, and in a vacuum, he always prefers that his opponent cooperates, and whether they do or not, he always prefers to betray them. You see here, the obvious contradiction, or rather hypocrisy, this is going to be a major theme here. For those who know the basics of game theory, you already know that whether cooperation or betrayal is the ideal play for any given prisoner depends on how many times the experience is repeated. If the game happens only once, or a few times, then betrayal will often get better results for a single prisoner. If it is to happen an infinity of times, then cooperation becomes the best of choices overall in the, in the long run. Hang on one sec, I'll be right back. All right, let's get back to it. Long run. Not the optimal individual strategy every time, but it does start to happen. Repeated simulations allow for complex stratagems that favor the cooperative to emerge, incorporating some of these patterns. The ability for forgiveness, lack of envy in the score of others, and the ability to retaliate against betrayal, but also, and perhaps most importantly, optimism in others, which is to start games by cooperating. Those sound like human virtues, right? Oh, did I lose the, uh... Oh, God damn it! I closed the wrong window. Give me a sec. I think we should still be live anyways. I think it doesn't matter if I'm, uh, actually looking at the screen or not but I do want to have it on there. I had Discord open. I wanted to close Discord and I clicked the X behind it. Yeah, it looks like we're still in business. Good. Sadly, the game of history limits us in this case 
to a small number of games, states only have so much memory as the governments that inhabit them, leading to quote-unquote resets of the game, so to speak. That's one of the point, one of the points of tension when applying this theory to nations. Think of all those groups of people just stuck in history due to the mass of their membership, their inertia, so to speak, and their forgetfulness. Those who are unable to retaliate or unable to forgive a wrong, unable to trust and unable to stop envying the success of others. For those who don't know of the prisoner's dilemma already, allow me to explain. It is a parable that demonstrates the phenomenon of rationality paradox. That is to say, that less rational players of a game will achieve better results than rational ones when put together. Another way of seeing this is that players seeking to maximize Thanks, their Tyler. individual scores will actually jeopardize everybody's scores, including themselves. In the prisoner's dilemma, the least amount of prison for everyone will be achieved on average if everybody cooperates. But the least amount of prison, on average again, for a single person will be achieved if he betrays the other while the other cooperates. Knowing this, both players can attempt betrayal and end up in the worst possible outcome for both, multiple times if necessary. Isn't that curious? Uh, Sirius says, uh, President Sunday, I'm just now catching up, but I wanted to know you said Xi Jinping has been said to have read Realist IR. Not just said to have read Realist IR, he's been, he's been translated as quoting directly from it. Um, well, specifically from uh, uh, Thucydides, and he's referred to Thucydides' trap, um, which is not like a super reputable thing in IR, but it has had like wide popular uptake, as again, evidenced by the fact that heads of state have taken it seriously. Is there a sense in which realism makes itself, like people read it and behave, that's exactly the problem? Because when people, well, I mean, to a certain extent, it is, to a certain extent, I, I suppose, if you're running off of a faulty paradigm, you'll run yourself aground. But how far can you get before that becomes apparent, right? Um, we're dealing with superpowers with massive military forces with their fingers and pies all over the world and with uh, nuclear weapons. How many shots do you have before you realize that your theory is cor incorrect? Because, again, people with political science degrees typically don't become heads of state. It's usually either uh, rich people, celebrities, or lawyers. That under these conditions, both rational actors attempting to minimize their prison years will end up maximizing the total amount of years? Do you see where I'm getting at? The minimum... The word of the day is reification. This suggests is that there are a few problems with the concept of rationality as we understand it and as we use it to understand. <laughs> oh, fuck. Isn't that a bad surprise? Oh, no. What a curse, my dear viewers, to realize that there is such a place of such darkness that our eyes can't see, that our minds can't enter. How forlorn are we that the virtue of virtue is the soul of our modern era, the very principle of our aspirations and wants is suddenly found inappropriate and denied. This is one of the aspects of the great ill we call the crisis of modernity. Is there such a geography whose natural frontiers are also that of our rational selves? So, you might want to ask, where did our doctrine go so wrong? Is trying to maximize a value irrational in itself? No. That's the same as aiming for a certain outcome. What? Is it competition between two agents that which precludes rationality then? No, it can't. If the prisoners were not rewarded for betraying, then the oh, rational outcome okay, for each would coincide with the overall rational outcome. Is it then self-interest that is irrational, and should we be interested in others' well-being instead? No, not even that. It's easy to swap around the consequences of each action to make it a dilemma for those sort of people, as well, well as a dilemma for those so who try to minimize everybody's prison time, and those who try to minimize only one given person's prison time. What is happening is that for each time the choice for each agent is predicated on what their opponent does, there exists an arrangement of outcomes that becomes un- Okay, okay, apply, it, apply the prisoner's dilemma to IR. Here we go. Anyway. Do these rationality dilemma situations actually happen in Why are you in a grid? Oh boy. So, the prisoner's dilemma is also known outside of game theory as uh, Rousseau's stag hunt. 
Schelling's Dilemma or the Hobbesian Trap. It has been cited, for instance, okay. as the main cause of the Peloponnesian War. Hobbesian. I know it's spelled Hobbesian, but his name is Hobbes, so it's Hobbesian. War. According to Thucydides' account of it, he wrote, oh. What made the What did he just call him? The Peloponnesian War. According to Thucydides' account of it, Thucydides. He wrote, What made the war inevitable was the growth of Athenian power and the fear which this caused Sparta. So, what exactly are we talking about? The premise. Thucydides. Sounds like a disease. The premise is the following. When confronted with a potential. The infection of the Thuce. Threat that could cause a perilous war, is it better to sit tight and face potentially disastrous consequences or attack preemptively? and thereby make the possibility of war a self-fulfilling prophecy. Bismarck, in one of his rare cases of lucidity, called this to commit suicide out of fear of dying. Sadly, this wisdom was found absent on the eve of the First World War, when the German Empire faced or pretended to face a similar situation with regards to Russia. Now, Bismarck is known for being an okay-ish diplomat arriving after the facts of the greatest seminal events of his century, but he had to compose with these questions of how states cooperate and avoid war, and he found- Okay, I can't do it. Let's just, let's just continue. Damn. Right, hey, that's the wrong one. No, we need to go back here. Orgenthal also argued that national interests are dynamic, meaning they change of- Hang on, I think we were farther back here. We are like, here, Morgenthau. Use the author Hans Morgenthau, who is one of the founding thinkers of modern realism as a school of international relations and geopolitics. This is not just. I also generally wouldn't recommend Morgenthau if you're trying to understand modern international relations. He's influential, but I would. Your best bet, honestly, if you're not going to read critical material on it, which would be much better use of your time, um, and I, I have recommendations there. Uh, immediately, uh, Brian Schmidt has a book called The uh, Discourse of Polit the Int Discourse of Political Anarchy? Or The Political Discourse of Anarchy? Hang on, I keep getting the title wrong. The Political Discourse of Anarchy. I think it's The Political Discourse of Anarchy. Yes, The Political Discourse of Anarchy by Brian C. Schmidt. Um, that's a really good book that actually gives you the a, uh, a conceptual history um, of international relations theory from American political science and before. Highly recommend that. Um, I also highly recommend... If you can find a copy, and I think you can find e-copies. In fact, I'm sure you can. I think I have some in my server's library. Um, this was a professor I studied under for a little while. Uh, Robert Walker's uh, Inside Outside International Relations as Political Theory. I highly recommend. If you must read um, directly uh, from influential international relations theorists that are more or less contemporary, uh, Kenneth Waltz. Um, Man, State, and War. I recommend that one. Um, I really don't recommend Mearsheimer, except that he's influential right now as kind of almost a meme, basically. Um, but I mean, you may as well read Dugan at that point. They're just not good. They're not good at all. They're highly reductive. Um, they're, they're less, there's less depth in Waltz and, and frankly, Morgenthau as well, and definitely Mearsheimer than there isn't someone like John Rawls. ...say that he is the only one, or Can the I most serious? important, there are many other important realist thinkers. Mm -hmm. Morgenthau just happens to be the one that I read, and a more familiar... That's not, a, that's not Morgenthau. So he's holding up a hard copy, but that's not Morgenthau. Look, I'll, I'll show you what, I'll show you what um, Politics Among Nations looks like, because I've held a copy, because I, I read it in the library. Um, Hans Morgenthau. Politics Among Nations, uh, hardcover. Yeah, here we go. So let's, let's pull this up here. So this is what, this is what Politics Among Nations looks like. It's a big book. It's not the biggest book you'll ever have, but it's big. It's it's long. It's it's easily about if memory serves about three hundred pages. What he's holding here 
is like a Milia with specifically his book. Poetry. It's like this. It's like it's almost a. It's like a booklet. It's tiny. This is this is a Mac hat analysis. Um, I actually haven't read a Mac hat analysis, but there are a lot of companies that make stuff like this. Um, Mac hat generally produces sort of uh, they're like they're, they're, well, they're like cliff notes or they're like spark notes or things like that. They're like short little things. They might have excerpts in them, but basically it's a it's a politics among nations for dummies. It simplifies it right down. Ooh, wait, we have we can see his bookshelf. Okay, we can do a bookshelf analysis. Let's take a look here. The Rutledge History of Terrorism, very nice. Rutledge Handbook of Democratization in East Asia, very nice. There's no way in hell he's read all these. Um, ooh, The Sea and Civilization, very good. Ticks amongst nations. Okay, move your books. Like the the ah, no, move your books so we can see it. I want to see your shelf, man. Bunch of random history books. Uh, Foucault, Madness and Civilization. It's not the edition I would recommend. Uh, whatever. Specifically his book, Politics Amongst Nations. Like Thucydides and Machiavelli, Morgenthau argued that all international relations is driven by natural laws of struggles for power between states. Thucydides and Machiavelli never said that. States. His theory is not just descriptive, it has predictions. To formulate and implement effective policy, one should not build it upon one's ideals of what one believes is good for society, but study power dynamics, understand the natural laws that govern power struggles between human beings, and formulate one's policy on what would work most effectively in this power struggle. Morgenthau argued that nation-states are the foundation of all international politics, and that national interests were the main motivations behind all foreign policies, that the desire for and pursuit... Which is silly, and if you actually read, like, serious political science texts um, that, are, that people in international relations theory basically never touch, because they're almost entirely absorbed with drawing historical examples and trying to develop rules, you'll see that that's untenable. Um, here's a problematic book, not perfect, not unchallengeable, but it introduces like a, well, throws a, a wrench into the monkey here. Um, here's, here's a, here's a nice, uh, fascist student of Max Weber's called Robert Michel. He wrote a book called Political Parties, a Sociological Study of the Oligarchical Tendencies of Modern Democracy. Why am I bringing this up? One of the things that he spends a lot of time going into is that, uh, political parties have their own self-interest. And as a result, the Democratic Party may uh, in deploy uh, strongly anti-democratic tactics um, in terms of its internal governance, in terms of its policy decisions once in power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, because, once again, it has its own interests, its leadership has their own interests, and down and down it goes. Every single person in that organization has something else, namely themselves and, and their belongings and their prosperity and so on that they are more concerned about than the well-being of the state. And so it is It is not the case that um, states are, are ever run or represented by people who actually, like the decisions are never made by people who have the interests of the states at heart, truly. Sometimes they think they do, but it, it's basically an impossibility. I mean, moreover, if you know how the sausages are made, you would never be so idealistic about the state in the first place that you would rank it so high on your list of priorities. States are not communities. States aren't uh, equivalent to polices or, or, or to even uh, even to like um, uh, the, the so-called city-states of Machiavelli's time. They are uh, hierarchical bureaucratic entities that value that attach no specific value to any one of its members or to any of its like cultural or philosophical content they're 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 corporations and they're simply corporations of raw power at best to secure the existence and continuation of the state was the reason for and a secret history of china is that like dark academia but in the three kingdoms ha 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 nation states engaged in the world to enlarge or defend their national interests the power being defined by morgenthau as the control over the minds and actions of men in particular political power as 
the mutual relations of control among the holders of authority and between the latter and the people at large. Because of the fact that nation-states pursue an expansion of their sphere of influence in competition with others, insecurity and the threat of violence is a constant, ever-present state that will never go away. Hence, the full title of politics among nations, the struggle for power and peace. That is because every nation state is out there to oh, use whatever okay, means sir. it can to expand its national influence. Additionally, being exclusively defensive in one sphere of influence rather than offensive in growing a sphere of influence does not often work as a means to escape the constant potential for conflict. Because even if every actor was faithfully doing this, any defensive action taken by nation states could be seen as offensive by its competitors and therefore produce a counter-defensive action, thereby continuing a cycle of aggression. Realists call this the security dilemma. Morgenthau also argued that national interests are dynamic, meaning they change over time and are influenced by factors such as culture and technology. One has to constantly reevaluate what one's national interests are, for if they change and one doesn't realize this, it is possible to waste enormous resources only to just lose the game of power. Let me give an example. After the end of Mongol rule over China, the Chinese spent almost 600 years fighting and trying to conquer the steppe peoples of Mongolia and Central Asia. It wasn't their interest at the time. They wished to secure themselves from the invaders of the past, and they wanted to make sure that something like the Mongol conquest of China could never ever happen again. But in doing so for almost 600 years, the Chinese neglected every other geopolitical sphere, such as their eastern neighbors. They neglected their coastlines. They lost spheres of influence over Japan and the rest of Asia. They neglected seafaring. They neglected technological developments in ocean navigation. They neglected new military technologies that were not useful in fighting steppe peoples. They neglected bureaucratic and institutional reforms. They neglected the new economic developments around coastal commerce. And they neglected the resulting cultural and political developments in societies. Consequently, they did not realize the significance of European imperial powers arriving. By the 1780s, the Chinese had successfully conquered and pacified Mongolia, Southeast Siberia, and the eastern parts of Central Asia. But the peoples from these lands who they had conquered and who had, yes, menaced China for almost 2,000 years, had stopped being a threat to China 300 years before. Mongolia was no longer the priority national interest. Instead, the British opium merchants who arrived at the same time along the coast were. China did not realize that its national interests had changed, and consequently, China took a huge loss in the game of power. As this example shows, there is no such thing as a permanent national interest. A nation should not consistently pursue the same goal throughout time, because the environment can substantially change. Therefore, according to Morgenthau, one should continuously study and reevaluate the national interests of a nation. And this is one of the major flaws, by the way, even by its own lights, because if you're... Organisms don't stand apart from their environment, right? They also create their environment. They, they uh, alter the... They, they take in elements from it, they expel them. They change the makeup of, of, their, of their niche or their biome because they interact with the organisms in it. If you insist, I mean, true, like there is no persistent interest for any rational agent in time because interests are, well, they're, they're secured, they are lost, ameliorative uh, alternative interests are pursued when they're lost, or like new interests are, are realized once old interests are secured, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you insist that the state is forever, that there is always nation states at the bottom of everything. Well, you've actually fixed interests in a very seriously intellectually stultifying way. Um, because you need to be able to move past the nation state paradigm. Um, because it isn't forever. It is a really a big concatenation of processes that happen to be working together in time. And that approach seems to do some positive work for some people apparently in the very short term while the consequences of of like bad frames of reference haven't really come to light but give it a little while the the contemporary notion of the nation state is is not old it's very young um it's actually roughly a hundred years old now 
It's it's very very recent. It will not be the same um, in even potentially half a, half a lifetime from now. And adapt to changing dynamics of the power game. Morgenthau also argued that any idealism is entirely misplaced, self-limiting and pointless in the study of international politics. Nation states, groups, communities and societies may develop concepts of morality and ethics, but a universal application of such systems of ethics is not possible because every moral system must be trickled down to the specifics of any given situation. Nations therefore ought to separate their own moral aspirations from ideals of moral universalism, legalism or sentimentality. Values and concepts of ethics should be strived towards discussion of implementation at home, but have no place on the international stage. The inspiration and historic events that led the political scientist Morgenthau to conclude this were the failure of idealistic international organizations and governing bodies such as the League of Nations in preventing the Second World War. In summary, Morgenthau argued that there are ultimately no ideals or rules that govern international politics and relations. Instead, international politics is driven solely by power politics, and the only rules that exist are informal and created not deliberately, but by the restraints of one's power by other powers. Morgenthau believed that international politics is somewhat like a poker game, that this poker game is played by great powers, such as the United States, the Soviet Union, and China, that these great powers have spheres of influence which contain smaller nation states, and these smaller nation states are the chips played in the poker game of geopolitics. Therefore, foreign policy should be driven with a disregard of idealism in favor of cold, hard-boiled calculations of how to play this poker game. But here's the catch. The game never stops. From the realist perspective, nobody can ever win this game. The poker game is assumed to be endless. The poker chips are constantly exchanged in an endless power struggle. Nobody can ever fully enforce their ideals over others because this power struggle is shaped by cold national interests and power. Great powers may sometimes lose their great power and thereby lose their spheres of influence Hang on. to new great Is Marks being labeled an idealist here? I didn't catch that. I might have been too busy shooting Necromorphs. Let me check quickly. Marx is not an idealist. Not in the slightest, dear God. Maybe by implication? Let me roll back a little bit here quickly. ...politics is somewhat like a poker game, that this poker game is played by great powers, such as the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. That these great powers have sphered... Like Mar Marx's analysis, I, I mean, here, here's, here's the thing. A lot of critics of Marx, in fact, basically all critics of Marx outside of um, people who have been directly influenced by him, um, the general assumption is that because his name is attached to uh, optimistic, perspective, forward-looking, revolutionary political projects, that therefore Marx himself wasn't an eminently grounded figure. Leaving aside how you judge revolutionary action generally, um, and I think that's a foolish way to characterize it, as if we haven't seen uh, an increasing frequency of radical uh, paradigmatic revolutions in politics over the past couple hundred years. Um, the Marx is, is entirely, entirely grounded in, Jeez. Hey, uh, the, these are, these are the organizational features of, of our world as determined by, um, the things in our environment that we can engage with and that we can perceive we can engage with and that we perceive as being constitutive of our interests. Um, Marx is about as, as grounded and quote unquote realistic as as you can get. There's there's almost no idealism in, in Marx. Um, certainly his tendency is not towards idealism. That's not the case with realists. Realists are heavily idealistic. Of influence, which contain smaller nation states, and these smaller nation states are the chips played in the poker game of geopolitics. Therefore, foreign policy should be driven with a disregard of idealism in favor of cold, hard boiled calculations of how to play this poker game. But here's the catch. The game never stops. No. no From no. the realist perspective. <laughs> no. no, the catch, the catch is that um, those smaller states are not poker chips. Those smaller states are filled with untapped or undiscovered or unrevealed um, powers and agents that themselves have, have, have tentacles going all over the world and interact with each other in, in, in un, unknowable or incalculable ways. Um, and moreover, they are themselves only formally distinct from each other in many cases. 
Um, this is no. This is this is. I mean, I realize he's not. He, he's criticizing realism, but nobody can ever win this game. The poker game is assumed to be endless. The poker chips are constantly exchanged in an endless power struggle. Nobody can ever fully enforce their ideals over others because this power struggle is shaped by cold national interests and power. Great powers may sometimes lose their great power and thereby lose their spheres of influence to new great powers, but geopolitics will always be dominated by great powers and struggles over their spheres of influence. The potential for violence and escalation, therefore, never stops. The realist also assumes that if all players gang up on one, that one will stand up and draw a gun before losing to everyone. And it is that potential for violent escalation that the realist wants to avoid at all costs, in particular in the post-World War II era of nuclear weapons. Now, let me interrupt you briefly to address something. Many of you will have probably noticed and already pointed out in the comments how similar a lot of this is to the writings of very different thinkers from very different schools, like Habermas, Adorno, Karl Schmitt, Alfred Rosenberg, Julius Sevola, Hoppe or Michel Foucault. The underlying assumption that there are no values, that ideals and ideologies and rules are just lies and excuses, and that all that matters are power dynamics. No, no, not all that matters are power dynamics, but power dynamics. Oh my God. None of those people think that that's, that's reductive to the point of absurdity. Dynamics and the game of power. The fact that they all sound so similar is not a coincidence and neither is it a testimony to the influence of more. Yes, it is. Foucault is an historian of ideas and concepts and culture. Um, Carl Schmidt absolutely does not reduce everything to power. Um, I mean, uh, whatever you even mean by power in this case. I, I, don't, I don't know what he's referring to, and that's, again, one of the problems is that, like, the, the international relations theorists are almost universally just conceptually impoverished to the extreme. Like, they have a bunch of game pieces, and that's all they can do. Augenthal. The reason why they all sound so similar is because of a shared historical experience. It is not a coincidence, but it is also not a conspiracy. They may all sound similar, they may have even partially read each other, but they didn't all conspire somehow to come to and promote similar conclusions. And that is because they all have their origins in the same thing, something oh no. called the crisis of modernity. Oh god. Oh my god. Ugh. Oh. <sighs> That's not what the crisis of modernity is. What is the crisis of modernity? In the wake of the Enlightenment, there was a common understanding throughout political schools of thought that humanity could advance and perfect itself through the rational examination of the world it inhabited, bypassing the crude institutions of unjustified tradition and faith that held society back. There was a frontier to be won, and with it the promise of a perfected civil and moral order for mankind. From that perspective, in 1789, the French Revolution upended a thousand years of primitive despotism and institutional stagnancy, guided by bold propositions inherited straight from the Enlightenment. Universal human rights, freedom, equality and brotherhood. Ideals that every contemporary liberal... These weren't, these weren't inherited from, from the Enlightenment. This, this was an Enlightenment event. Um... Or democracy is built upon. A few years into the revolution, Kant published Zum Ewigen Frieden, or Toward a Perpetual Peace, a treatise of international relations that is the foundation of a liberal theory of international relations. No, advanced... no, 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 no. Perpetual peace is the, um, it's written above in the beginning of, of the essay. It's written above, I, I think, like a, a tavern sign. And it's showing like a graveyard or something, or a coffin. And perpetual peace is death. That's what he's referring to. Um, it's not a theory of international relations. It is a theory of historical development. 
in which an agonistic process, uh, the the what he calls the the unsocial sociability of man, wherein we are all because of like amor pro, which is the, the Rousseauian idea that we we have this love of self that is in fact the love of our social self, our projection. So we care about reputation, we care about honor, etc., etc. So we don't just live peacefully by ourselves and just enjoy life. Uh, we have to become greater in the eyes of our peers. And so we compete with each other and we fight with each other. And we try to out-invent and outsmart and outperform one another. And as a result, you have immense leaps of progress um, until eventually uh, you, you find that we have reached such a level of advancement that we figure out that, no, we should not go to war with each other. We should just continue this, just have like a global international, uh, sorry, not even international, just a global system um, that is static, in which war is done away with, and we basically just just live within it and compete with each other to build and build and build it. It's the transition from Europa Universalis to City Skyline. Um, and if anyone's played City Skylines, then you, you know how uh, intrinsically uh, reactionary and conservative its ideological foundations are. I'm making a video on that right now. Um, it's not a theory of international relations. Um, perpetual peace references directly the end of an historical process of development. And that's critical to understanding uh, Kant's politics. In technology and science enabled the uplifting of standards of living, travel, education, while the abundance of production increasingly melted away the entrenched poverty of the world, together with breakthroughs in medicine and sanitation, such as through the eradication. To my understanding, yeah, Titan, to my understanding, the uh, that phrasing, the crisis of modernity, referred to a lowering of, of intellectual quality of individual subjects as a result of the increased mechanization of the, and I guess the, um, the simplification of and specialization of human tasks. Um, not simplification in the sense of like, you know, technical detail, but in the sense of how much an individual is actually engaged with at a given time. You become a lawyer, you're concerned with law, you're concerned with a very narrow range of interests, and you only do this. If you are a scientist in any given field, this is all you do. And never between shall meet with all of these things. Um, gone are the days of like the the great polymaths with these massive 600 page treatises of everything. Um, a modern day Hegel is an instant crank as they should be. But that's, that's the problem though, is, is there is no one person who can actually hold it all in. We've, we've lost the ability to make judgments at that scale. And as a result, uh, you know, gormless, artless technocrats make all of the decisions. <laughs> And the world is awful as a result. Education of germs. During this sudden hiccup of years of progress... You didn't know City Skylines was reactionary? Uh, look at um, how things like immigration and uh, poverty are managed. Um, where you want to find the, the ideological um, assumptions of paradox games generally, uh, don't look at how the game itself runs. Look at... They will have different different things, different values, and see what they do. If uh, more religion means more unity and more stability, that's interesting. That's an interesting assumption. Why is that an assumption? If more cultural intermingling results in less stability or results in uh, like decreased order or, or whatever, or, or any number of things, that's an interesting assumption. Is it justified by the game? No, it's an assumption. Um, moreover, uh, a lot of these games are taking after previous games that were themselves based off of fairly reactionary literature. So, for instance, there's a really good essay that I read a little while ago um, on the, uh, the creation of the first SimCity game. And uh, the... Is it Brian Forrester? Um... The first SimCity game was inspired, partially, let me see if I can find the, the correct name here, it was inspired partially, uh, George, no, J. Forrester, there we are, it was inspired partially by a book that I think was passed around uh, by Kennedy's administration, 
um, by a book called uh, Urban Dynamics by Jay Forrester. In which specific influences are attached to things um, like... We're getting, we're getting far afield. But you have like the introduction of things like the perversity thesis, as, uh, as Albert Hirschman calls it. In which um, there is an ideological entrenchment of the idea that measures taken to improve the human condition in some way uh, will categorically, almost as a rule, um, result in the the degeneration of the human condition. So that's that's what why it's, he calls it the perversity thesis. It's a thesis that um, anything that is is intended for good uh, will result in bad. And this is typically um, fielded against uh, revolutionary or reformative action, reformational action. Uh, pretty much across the board and it starts with um it starts with people like uh edmund burke who argued that hey look look guys i get it i get it you're starving you don't have rights whatever but uh but we've we've accrued these societal goods over thousands of years these are hard-won things and what you will do if you overturn society is you will lose everything and you will descend into a new tyranny. In fact, they did as a result of the French Revolution, as a result of several revolutions, in fact. Um, we have an unprecedented level of freedom and prosperity that we would not have had if that had not taken place. Um, anyways, moving on. Critique of realism. Crowd, go. During the 1800s, what had seemed impossible for all of history, the methodical repealing of every horseman of the apocalypse, is made possible through rational examination of the physical world, and it yields many more bounties, knowledge of the universal laws, mastery over nature. Hegel, the prime example of this historicism of the 19th century, observed the spreading of the Enlightenment ideas and declared that the realization of human freedom is the ultimate goal of history and that it will come to be through the creation of the perfect state. When he witnessed Napoleon defeat Prussia at Jena in 1806, he declared that this moment was the end of history. The French had created the political innovation of the nation-state, and all of history as a political development was just a process of achieving what the French had achieved. But that belief in progress through modernity, that had so domineered throughout political schools of thought throughout the 1800s, was shattered at the beginning of the 20th century. Verdun, the Somme, Passchendaele, Isonzo, Gallipoli. In the killing fields of the First Global War, where generations experienced mechanized death brought on by technological and scientific development, a war that was promised by those who believed in political progress that it would be the last war, only for their promise to be almost immediately broken by the Second World War, which industrialized the death process and spread it, by design, to civilian populations. It would be a mistake to assume that faith in modernity, which we understand as rationalist drives, was upended merely by the process of applied sciences. Almost every field is confronted at the same time by limitations of pure rationality. In mathematics, there is the foundations crisis, where formalists stand refusing proofs of the intuitionist camp, on the grounds that they require an infinite number of steps that can therefore not be reproduced formally. Yet this is how we proceed to build real numbers. Gödel throws the whole field into disarray when he theorized Hang on, the wait axioms a minute. wait a minute. Hang on, what was this? ...on by technological and scientific development, a war that was promised by those who believed in political progress that it would be the last war, only for their promise to be almost immediately broken by the Second World War, which industrialized the death process and spread it, by design, to civilian populations. It would be a mistake to assume that faith in modernity, which well, we not, understand as that's not that's not by design. It's it's as a consequence of the entire entire community's industry being purposed towards the war effort. That's why you destroy the civilian centers. You destroy the beating heart that gives the military its 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 energy. Nationalist drives was upended merely by the process of applied sciences. Almost every field is confronted at the same time by limitations of pure rationality. In mathematics, there is the foundations crisis, where formalists stand refusing proofs of the intuitionist camp, 
on the grounds that they require an infinite number of steps that can therefore not be reproduced formally. Yet this is how we proceed to build real numbers. Gödel throws the whole field into disarray when he theorized that the axioms of mathematics can neither be consistent or able to prove all true theories, sending all mathematicians ever since into an exercise of faith in their axiomatic systems. In physics, the quantum realm fractures the discipline into various schools, the schism being still unresolved. Among others, the uncertainty principle that you can neither know accurately the position or the speed and direction of a particle raises questions about the limits of rational observation and experimentation. Okay, look. In e I have I have almost no knowledge of the history of mathematics. I'd like to correct that at some point in the near future. But this is not the crisis of modernity. I, I think he's confusing the crisis of modernity with like fear mongering about relativism, a la Jordan Peterson. The crisis of modernity, again, insofar as it's a thing, refers to the fear of there being a degeneration in human intellectual capacity as a result of increasing specialization, as a result of the increasing mechanization and like technical specialization of, of, of individuals in, in modern society. That's the crisis of modernity. I have no idea what the hell he's going on about. Economics and international relations, paradoxes of rationality force the injection of psychology in endeavors of formal rationalism, creating behavioralism where an arithmetic of wealth what? distribution and peacemaking was anticipated. In 1938, Husserl wrote in The Crisis of European Sciences and Buddy, you haven't read The Crisis. You have not read Husserl. You have not read Husserl. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. phenomenology of a crisis of European humanities, the disproportionate evolution of the hard sciences compared to the humanities. Though mathematical and physical problems may cast doubt upon the role of rationality as a driver of human progress, the worst development is not that the claim to modernity of the sciences is broken, but that the humanities broke before the sciences did. For what? example, humanity advanced into the nuclear age without the political tools to make humanity's survival in a nuclear age a certainty and in our day and age while having still not so humanity's survival in any age hasn't been a certainty we could have been hit by a meteor or by disease at any given point it's sheer dumb luck that a virus hasn't uh evolved at this point that can't just wipe us out like covid if it just kills us slowly enough that we can't find a vaccine for it, or that we can't vaccinate against or, or maybe just our medical systems just break and we end up reverting and something else kills us. Like, there's, this is silly. This conundrum of the nuclear age, a second, that of climate change, piles on as the gap between science and the humanities remains. Ironically, centuries before we faced these conundrums, figures of the Enlightenment itself were already aware of this conundrum and warned of it. As the French Renaissance humanist Francois Rabelais famously wrote, science without conscience is but ruin of the soul. Hegel's vision of a perfect state that would end history died in the early 20th century. What? The struggles and conflicts perpetuated by those who wished to achieve that end of history. What was left in its ashes was not an idealistic striving for modernity, but best described by Churchill, the worst system of government with the exception of all others. Churchill's rashness towards other forms of government stems from the fact that he spent a great deal of his career fighting... I'll be right back, guys. Oh my god, this is so painful. Come on, Kraut. Just, just keep it narrow. Do something. Stay, stay in your lane. You're not stupid. You can do good work. I've seen you do good work before. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Uh, slightly less lazy. What if all this crap? Don't, don't do this.
replacing them. The main political innovation of the 20th century and a direct answer to modernity were the fascist and totalitarian regimes whose main accomplishments were the destruction of idealism. Why the fascist and totalitarian? What are you talking about? The fascist and totalitarian regimes. I hate this language of totalitarian. It's actually so silly. What does it refer to? What does it refer to? What state does not have uh, legal or, 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 or policing or anything? What state does not insert its tentacles into every facet of society? I mean, the whole idea of sovereignty in modern international relations presumes an element of totality in it. This is, this is a silly distinction. Why don't, why don't you just say, uh, well, I don't even know what the hell he means. I mean, fascism directly explicitly takes his cues from Hegel, which he quoted earlier, well, paraphrased earlier. Perfection of the state is the highest end. Um, what does fascism do? It, it elevates the, the state's integrity, survival, and prosperity as the highest end of a people, and so all of human life is subordinated to the glory of the state. Like, the, the ghost writer of the doctrine of fascism, uh, falsely attributed to Mussolini, is Giovanni Gentili, who is an infamous Hegelian philosopher. <laughs> ...institutions, violent lawless barbarism, and the creation of new crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. In the Soviet Union, communism, a political force that supposedly would usher in the end of history through a supposedly scientific understanding of humanity and history, ushered in a regime of mass arrests, paranoia, gulags, mass graves, and famines. The fact that these systems, which were always constructed as a rejection of the modern world, not only existed, but were able to seriously threaten modernity for the better part of the century, was felt as the final traumatic wake-up oh, call shit, from the historicism of modernity for many thinkers, at least those who made it out of the early 20th century alive. Stefan Zweig wrote a very quotable suicide note disguised as a book called The World of Yesterday, in which he reminisces the pre-war world which he adored, from which the fascists drove him because of his ethnicity, and gives an account of the losing fight that he and his fellow intellectuals fought to prevent its methodical destruction during the world wars. My friend Frog recommended me this book, and I highly recommend that book to you as well. Many political thinkers concluded from the horrors from 1914 to 1945 that modernity and the idea of progress was a lie. Almost all of them concluded that what mattered in the end were just power dynamics. The reason all the thinkers I cited earlier sound so similar is because they all have similar origins in a time period in which the concept of modernity and the concept of idealism was questioned. Fascists saw modernity as a manipulation. The Nazis saw it as a Jewish lie. The Nazis specifically believed that what ultimately mattered was competition for resources between races, and the power dynamics of a race war is all that oh matters. Boy. One of the foundational texts of Nazi political theory is Alfred Rosenberg's The Myth of the 20th Century, in which he outlines a theory of history as mainly driven by racial struggles and competition for resources. The Nazi legal theorist Karl Schmitt declared the liberal state to be too weak for the preservation of a functioning social order. Declared what? that all politics was struggles no. for power between any... No, no, no. The liberal st Jesus Christ. The liberal state for Karl Schmitt isn't too weak for the functioning of a social order. A liberal reduction of politics to... Well, sorry. A, a, the liberal ideological insistence that politics should be, should be subordinate to the rule of law is too weak to... to well, to sustain anything, because you, you basically gamified politics. Now, if the, the Nazis, or more accurately, the socialists or the communists, uh, manage to game the system enough, they can upend, even democratically, your entire system. Which means that if you abide by that, if you refuse, for example, in the case of Weimar, where uh, this immediately comes to bear in the case of Carl Schmitt, if you refuse to invoke the articles of the Weimar Constitution that allow you to make uh, unilateral exceptional action to, like, break up these bad actors or these toxic actors, eventually they will poison your system and they will take it over and your system will be gone. That's the point. It's not that it's not that liberalism is weak. It's that you can't be weak to sustain liberalism. You have to be willing to break rules. Or more accurately, you have to be willing to be above rules. There has to be something to sustain a liberal system. Liberalism is more properly understood as like an ethos that a state can aspire to 
not as the foundation of a state's existence and security, because it doesn't secure that. <sighs> Anyways. Enemies, that all disagreements were ultimately conflicts between enemies, and that therefore a fascist leader must attain absolute power. Carl Schmitt also applied this line of thought in his writings on geopolitics as driven by nothing but ruthless cold power dynamics no. in which might makes right. And the no. fascist... No! No! No, that's not... That's not what Carl Schmitt says. Nobody competent says might makes right. That's silly. That's stupid. Of course might doesn't make right. People with might can lose their might because they've made the wrong decisions. Political theorist Julius Evola wrote in his Revolt Against the Modern World. Oh God! Why are you, why are you treating Evo Evola like like he's he's respectable? Evola's a crank. He's he's a crank. He wrote books on fucking magic. Nation was inherently a political force that lacked concepts of political theory and therefore contradicted the idea of progress or modernity, which had to be destroyed. Fascism fundamentally advocates for and is an ideology based upon the destruction of modernity and idealism in favor of a lawlessness. No, not at all. No, God, no. Fascism is thoroughly modern. It's it's completely modern and 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 fetishizes technology. It, it's it's like the most modern thing imaginable. If anything, there's almost like a. It's almost a nostalgic undercurrent in Marxism because its notion of human flourishing is derived from political ideals of human autonomy and leisure being associated with virtue and greatness. That That's... No, no, Nazism is, is one of the most modern things possible in the worst way, but it's very modern. ...of power dynamics. But they were not the pioneers of the crisis of modernity. A century before the Nazis, Johann Gottlieb Fichte spoke a series of speeches, the addresses to the German nation, which was an attack against the ideals that the French occupation had imported to Prussia. Fichte in his speeches outlined a concept of the world as a power struggle among races and in rejection of any ideals of universalism, freedom, equality and brotherhood. Adorno, Habermas and Foucault were leftists disillusioned with Marx because the material conditions for communism that Marx had predicted never came to be. They therefore abandoned the traditional Marxist historical materialism as a driving mechanism of history. They abandoned the concept of progress as well, and instead analyzed history with a focus on groups who had historically been oppressed. Be it colonized peoples, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, or sexual minorities. They concluded that there were no ideals or rules, but merely the power dynamics of oppression and liberation from oppression. Hoppe was a student of Habermas, who merely used the same conclusions to advocate for the abolition of any state concept of rules and ideals in favor of a ruthless, lawless, anarchist capitalism. And finally we get to Morgenthau, who came to his conclusions when faced with the rise of the Nazis and even argued explicitly in 1946 that belief in human reason was deficient because of the rise of Nazi Germany. It would be a mistake though to think of Morgenthau as, That's so stupid. as a Machiavellian figure instead of a tragic one. Morgenthau no, 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 oh my god, oh my god. Haas from Infrared understands this better than Kraut does. Machiavelli exists in a world in which there's a constant current of flux and political skill is being able to surf on it smoothly. Nope, there's a wave. You have the, have the wit and the learning to navigate the wave without falling over um he care he, he uses the highly sexist analogy of courting a woman and there's a massive tradition of this between him up to nietzsche where they say exactly this suppose truth is a woman yada 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 um he what he's talking about is uh political writs i guess um Morgenthau's not a Machiavellian. Nobody in international relations is a Machiavellian. Why? There's a, there's a section in Machiavelli that's really important to get that everybody ignores. Where are you? 
Where are you? There we are. I think I have a bookmark, actually. No, that's of avoiding being despised. Hang on. Give me a moment. We'll find it. It's a section that comes almost out of nowhere. Here we are. Uh, book in uh, chapter 20 of uh, Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince. Of whether fortresses and many things that princes employ every day are useful or harmful. And he concludes, considering all these matters then, I shall praise both those princes who construct fortresses and those who do not. And I shall reproach any prince who, trusting in fortresses, considers the hatred of the people to be of little importance. I, I'm not going to go, I, I've talked about this before, I'm not going to go into it. Uh, in depth here, but basically here's the idea. Um, because the world is in flux and because political virtu is being able to engage in time with savvy, um, there is no greater enemy mentally than the fixed point. That is the idea that there is one thing that you must at all times, at all times be oriented around or be f attached to, which is one of the reasons why He's both skeptical of fortresses, but also not categorically skeptical of fortresses. Because what is a fortress? Well, it's it's a fixed point. Here are some walls. We are seated we are seated here and we are counting on our ability to defend this particular point. So they can be both a trap, but sometimes they can be both necessary. Um the notion of the nation state upon which Hans Morgenthau depends conceptually is just that fortress. It is just that fixed point. But you have to be able to almost spiritually reorient yourself so that you're not thinking in terms of nation states or in terms of fortresses or in terms of polices or whatever. Just like, uh, I mean, here's here's somebody who you could anachronistically characterize as a Machiavellian. Um, Pericles. Uh, Pericles, who has the ingenious idea of, hey, we, we may not be able to fight uh, the, well, I mean, if we do fight the Spartans on land in the Peloponnesian War, we might be evenly matched. We will probably lose. They're very good at this, but our strength has never been in our walls or in our, our spears. It's always been in the thing that we are, and we can relocate this. We can rethink Athens as not a city on land, but as a city that can exist apart from the walls. So they build the long walls between the Piraeus, which is the big port, and Athens itself. They're very long walls. And the idea is, in the event of an attack, all the Athenians can run to the port, to the ships, and they can be a de facto island. And they can hold on to their empire, and they can maintain all of their power, even though Athens as such, in the literal sense, has been occupied by enemy forces. They have thought outside the fortress. Tau was a German liberal and supporter of the Weimar Republic. He lived through its collapse and the rise of fascism throughout Europe. He despaired at this, fled into exile in the United States, where he was confronted with an American unwillingness to face the outbreak of the Second World War and its consequences, right up until those came knocking at Pearl Harbor. He despaired at what he lived through and concluded that what he had witnessed had happened because liberalism and the liberal state were shackled by its own ideals and put in the same danger that had uprooted his life. Morgenthau therefore believed that liberal democracies of the world cannot engage in a foreign policy that is based on liberal ideas, that the liberal power of this world, the United States, must act ruthlessly and often against its own liberal values on the international stage to preserve itself. 
Contrary to his recommendations, though, Morgenthau did stand up to U.S. foreign policymakers in the name of his own morals on more than one occasion. For instance, he was one of the first academics to object to the Vietnam War. In 1966, in The Purpose of Political Science, Morgenthau wrote that the U.S. had overlearned the lessons of realism and lost sight of the appropriate legal and moral limits to the application of power and was even fired from his post because of his protest. In the early days of the Cold War, he was an opponent to policies of containment that could frivolously make enemies of the USSR. In the first edition of Politics Among Nations, he argued the changed structure of the balance of power has made the hostile opposition of two gigantic power blocks possible, but it has not made it inevitable, and considered a bipolar world having the potential for unheard of good as well as for unprecedented evil. At first he noted that bipolarity would fix in place the balance of power, alliances no longer being able to decisively affect it because of the sheer mass of the two superpowers and their ability to hold states in a block even against their will, thus creating spheres of influence. But in the third edition of Politics Amongst Nations, seeing the new block of unaligned nations, the experience of the Korean War, he prescribed that Moscow and Washington should adapt their policies to the wishes of their allies if they wanted to draw maximum strength from their support. To summarize his view, the United States are a poker player, Western Europe and South America are its poker chips. The Soviet Union is a poker player, Eastern Europe and Central Asia it's poker chips. And in order to secure a lasting peace, stability, and liberal democracy itself, American foreign policy must be focused on securing its own sphere of influence, while parallel to that, not infringing on the Soviet sphere of influence. The end goal of this realist foreign policy is to find and maintain a balance between okay, global... Okay, I hate that this is titled a critique of realism. Why don't I just make it a critique of Hans J. Morgenthau? Because that's really what he's getting at here. He's spending so much time on Morgenthau. Morgenthau is old hat. Uh, no, nobody uses Morgenthau anymore. Do we have timestamps? I can't remember. No, we don't. Okay. Powers. You've Whatever. probably already noticed, and you are correct, that realism played an important role in American Cold War foreign policy. After Morgenthau fled to the United States, his ideas were very welcomed among the leading political figures of the United States. Realism became the core foundation of American foreign policy for almost 50 years. It is the reason why the Americans did not intervene or do anything to help Eastern Europeans in anti-communist uprisings. From the realist point of view, these countries were in the Soviet and consequently Russian sphere of influence. Their aspirations for ending communist tyranny were irrelevant. They were in a Russian sphere of influence and in the interest of maintaining a balance of powers were left to whatever the Russians wanted to do with them. At the same time, the United States had to be utterly ruthless in maintaining control over its own sphere of influence, from the Cuban blockade to various American-backed military dictators, in order to secure its own sphere of influence. It should be pointed out there that realism does not offer some sort of singular objective formula that everyone follows through to the same conclusions. I mentioned before that Morgenthau was fired for protesting the war in Vietnam. There were realists who believed that Vietnam was in the American sphere of influence and crafted the infamous domino theory. But there were also prominent realists like Morgenthau who believed that Vietnam was not in the American sphere of influence. He also did not believe that Vietnam was in a Soviet or Chinese sphere of influence. He believed that Vietnam was fighting a civil war. And even though there was a communist side in this civil war, this did not mean that the Communist Party of Vietnam was aligned to the Soviet Union or Communist China. So, as you can see, realism does come with disagreements amongst realists. The archetype realist statesman, who many realists praise, is Henry Kissinger. He disdained international, idealistic and rules-based organizations such as the United Nations, but still used it for a policy of detente with the Soviet Union to preserve a balance of powers, while ruthlessly playing poker with Chile, Argentina, Vietnam, Syria, Israel, China, India and Bangladesh over the American sphere of influence, irrespective of what the United Nations may think of it. The Nixon administration was the height of realism being America's foreign policy doctrine. And by the standards of realism, the Nixon administration were expert poker players and are the ideal of what American foreign policy should be. They played Syria and Egypt out against each other to nudge Egypt into an American sphere of influence. They ended communist influence in South America through empowering brutal dictators and legitimized China as a play on the poker table to then leverage that against the Soviet Union for a policy of entente. And the architect of that realist golden age of American foreign policy was Henry Kissinger. 
Kissinger's honors dissertation that he wrote as an undergrad at Harvard attacked Kant and Hegel, specifically their notions of there being a process of historical progress. Instead, he argued that history was a continuous, chaotic process of power struggles, where ideological concepts and idealism over societal reform and progress were meaningless. Therefore, in no moral authority, concepts of ethics, no ideology, no religion, and no ideal whatsoever had any guiding role to play. A very nihilistic view, which Kissinger would later mirror as US Secretary of State when he said that the Soviet Union was an ever-present danger to the international world that would continue to exist for centuries to come, and therefore the American public should get used to it, that any striving to end the Soviet Union was pointless, and that instead one should come to terms with the fact that the future would be shaped by a geopolitical game of power and influence with the Soviet Union in which finding a balance of power would be the ideal foreign policy. Realism continued to dominate American foreign policy right up to the 1980s, when Reagan became US president. Reagan was not a realist, but an idealist. Reagan aggressively pursued the destruction of communist influence, including in places that were considered to be a Soviet sphere of influence, like Afghanistan, East Germany, and Poland. And it is the end- That is- What? of the Cold War where realism faced its greatest challenges. Because to many political theorists, the end of the Cold War and the death of communism proved that the realists had been wrong. Under the Bush 41 presidency, a new foreign policy doctrine was formulated from the success of the Reagan administration that saw the United States as the sole superpower, protector of the world's democracies, and the policeman who intervened when undemocratic regimes violated international rules. Bush also wanted Europe to sort out its own affairs and to refocus American attention on building deeper ties and alliances in East Asia instead of Europe. The ultimate goal of this would be in the long term to repeat with China what had happened to the Soviet Union. Under Clinton, the US returned to realism. That may sound surprising to you, but yes, many forget that the Clintons are students of Kissinger. So we saw a return to a foreign policy largely based on realist assumptions under the Clintons. The US had a guiding role over Europe, India was insultingly dismissed as a Russian poker chip, and Russia could do whatever it wanted to do to the Chechens, and most of its neighbors had to tie in line Oh my Russia. god, this is so tedious. Where, where's the critique of realism here? Like, holy fuck, he spent 36 minutes just rambling. Rambling. Bush 43 was part of a new conservative political school that evolved from Reagan, the neoconservatives. Believing that Reagan's aggressive idealism had ended the Soviet Union, they advocated for an even more aggressive Why are you telling us this? That America must enforce its ideal globally, and the worst violators must be militarily removed. As much as I want to try to be objective in this video, I think most of us can agree that that one was, in particular, a disaster. Obama was confusing. He basically tried to mix everything. Best example, he was a realist on Assad, who was permitted to massacre entire cities, while being an idealist on Gaddafi for threatening to massacre a city. He supported the Arab Spring, then backed those who undermined it, while doing an Iranian nuclear deal. He claimed to leave Europe to sort out its own affairs, but then he applied a realist foreign policy in Ukraine. Yes, many forget this, despite what Russian propagandists may tell you, in actuality, the Obama administration's policy on Ukraine in 2014 was that Yanukovych should stay in power and that Ukraine should remain in a Russian sphere of influence. Obama basically tried to use every approach and therefore ultimately did not achieve much at all, because his foreign policy lacked focus. Trump was a nationalist isolationist who shunned any and all idealism but also shunned realist ideas. America had no values to stand for, but America also should not have a sphere of influence, only money to make through defense contracts and trade deals. His foreign policy soured American relations with her ideals-based allies and empowered the world's authoritarians. I personally would argue that a combination of Obama's misguided realism on Ukraine and Trump's isolationism played substantial roles in encouraging Putin to invade Ukraine. And now we have Biden. It is kind of too soon to tell, but I think he is picking up the project of Bush 41. I believe Biden would like the Bush 41 project to be the common bipartisan foreign policy of both American political parties for the rest of this century. This is painful. Or at least until communist China collapses, since that seems to be its end. China's goal. not communist. 
Realism still exists as a school of foreign relations and geopolitics. It does sometimes get limelight and even influence in American foreign policy. But ever since Reagan, it has to share the table with other foreign policy ideas. In the post-Cold War era, a core tenet of realism has essentially become that the ideologies of the poker players have become irrelevant. The fact that Russia is no longer the Soviet what? Union is therefore irrelevant. Now that may sound weird to you, but That's to wrong. a modern realist, That's in many ways, ideology itself is irrelevant, be it the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, or the modern Russian state. From the realist perspective, these are just flags. They're just symbols representing a great power or a poker player. In some ways, the ideologies professed by nations are seen as nothing but national makeup or costumes, trends and fads that change with time, while the underlying geopolitical power struggle never changes. From the realist perspective, ideologies do not matter anymore, and whatever ideologies the rulers of Russia claim to believe are irrelevant, because internal political developments do not matter. What matters from the realist perspective is that Russia is a great power, and that that great power has a sphere of influence on the poker table that others ought to respect in order to find a balance of powers. And because of that, when looking at the war in Ukraine from the realist perspective, it is the United States who violated the balance of powers by infringing on the Russian sphere of influence through the advancing of democracy in Ukraine. Over the course of the last year, ever since the Russians invaded, and ever since people started posting Mersheimer clips or repeating his talking points, I have no doubt that we have all seen many enraged Ukrainians, Poles, Finns, Lithuanians, Estonians, Latvians, Belarusians, Czechs, Hungarians, Romanians, Bulgarians and Kazakhs who find realist talks, including those of Mersheimer, to be almost offensive. I am sure there are some of you in the audience right now as well. From the perspective of Mersheimer, all of you are in a Russian sphere of influence. And because of that, for America to maintain a balance of powers with Russia, it is in the interest of the United States that Russia gets to have a say in your politics. European realists are also outraged by this. From their realist perspective, Russia has no place in European politics. But European realists often forget that Mersheimer is not a European realist. He is an American realist. Merzheimer argues from a position of wanting to preserve an American hegemony as the great power of the Western Hemisphere. And from that perspective, America should try to preserve the status quo of the Cold War. And what you, the European realist, thinks is irrelevant. Merzheimer does not consider Europe to be a poker player, but merely oh, a bunch shit. of poker chips to be divided between the American and Russian spheres of influence. So, I hope this description of what realism is was objective and accurate. If you believe I failed, you should feel free to point that out in the comments. I'll... This wasn't a description of realism. You, you, you gave a long and meandering gloss of how Morgenthau in particular addressed X, Y, and Z, but th that's not realism. That's one guy. Realism has, has like changed since Morgenthau. Like you haven't even touched neorealism. And Mearsheimer is like a weird aberration. He's not even like consistent with other realists. I look forward to reading them. But with that explanation out of the way, there is something that I need to address. Something that is somewhat of an elephant in the room. And it mainly has to do with you, the subscribers. Namely, those of you who asked me to make this video. And that is because most of you specifically asked me to make this video in response to Marxist pundits, publications, and politicians who started repeating realist talking points and posting Mersheimer clips. I will not do that. I'm sorry, but I believe that doing that would be a waste of time. And if you have watched this video so far, you will probably understand why. These Marxist pundits are basically promoting a political theory that has its origins in American Cold War politics and that argues for an American hegemony over a sphere of influence. And I'm pretty sure that most of them are too stupid to even understand that. If you actually look... Sunday's being rude by not smoking a fat, juicy blunt on stream. I have a rule. I am not going to smoke until I'm 50. But when I'm 50, I will get the fattest, juiciest blunt possible into what Mersheimer proposes and not just watch selected clips through confirmation bias, you will find that the reason he opposes Western support to Ukraine is because he believes the Americans should concede Eastern Europe to becoming a Russian sphere of influence as part of a deal America can make with Russia as an alliance against China. 
I think many Marxist pundits that have posted Mersheim clips. Yeah, and by the way, once again, this is going to be... A... Oh my god, this is going to be such a woefully ill-advised thing. Mearsheimer's a crank, I'm sorry. And he's not a crank in the sense that he's kooky, he's a crank in the sense that he has a, 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 an impoverished theory that is overly determinative because it's overly simple. ...recently, or repeated his talking points. Don't... Oh, I've had edibles, but that's no fun. You can't really, like, you don't get to see it on stream, right? I've realized that Mearsheimer is by no means left-wing, but belongs to a political school of old-school conservative American Cold War warriors, Alan Nixon and Kissinger. Back during the Cold War era, Marxists were in fact some of the harshest critics of realism. They described realism as little more than a thin veneer to disguise imperialism. The very fact that Marxists these days are repeating realist talking points is an absurdity. These modern Marxist pundits of our day and age, to illustrate just how clownish this is, are literally advocating for the foreign policy school that is the cause of the Cuban blockade and Pinochet's coup. You may now understand why I believe that it would be a waste of time to address them or to make this video about them. They are either too stupid to understand what they are advocating, or they are just cynical. When Noam Chomsky, Jeremy Corbyn and Jean- I desperately want to quit stream right now and just make a grilled cheese sandwich. I'm just craving that so hard right now. Melenchon suddenly started arguing a realist position the moment Russia invaded Ukraine, I believe the only time you should waste on them is by pointing out that they are entirely dishonest and cynical. They themselves used to argue against realism, especially concerning the Cuban blockade. If you want to make sense of why they do this, I think you will get a far better insight by looking into something that Chomsky did in 2014. Back then, he was given an award for his linguistics work by a Czech university. He then toured the Czech Republic to give various talks. During these, he said that the Czechs suffered far less than the South Americans during their military dictatorships, basically arguing that the Czechs were exaggerating how much they suffered under their communist dictatorship and the Soviet occupation. Chomsky, in describing Czech history, magically begins in the 1960s and cuts out the Stalinist era of the 1940s and 50s, during which tens of thousands of Czechs were murdered as if it never happened. He claimed that the only reason Czech anti-communist dissidents became popular in Czechia was because of an American propaganda conspiracy, that figures such as Václav Havel were basically agents of American imperialism, that they were hypocrites and not true revolutionaries because they were friendly with the United this States. This is so boring. Basically, all of Czech history since 1945. Look, the communist look, coup, the Stalinist I've party. made long video essays, okay, and maybe not this long. Oh, I... I guess. No, I think the nationalism was about 52 minutes. Look, it's okay to do long video essays, but the, the points have to lead to one another. This is just like a mad woman's breakfast. There's just... And Chomsky, and Reagan, and... Like, come on, man. Critiquing realism. Realism is a conceptual framework. Critique the conceptual framework. I'm not seeing a critique here. We're 45 minutes in. God damn it! This is so slow! Purges, the Prague Spring, the thousands murdered and tortured, the period of stagnation, and the struggles of those who resisted it all. All of it is swept away as one gigantic irrelevancy by Chomsky in one big whataboutism. One can paraphrase Chomsky's oh attitude God. towards the Czech people basically with a I will conveniently erase... Why? We haven't heard a critique of realism so far. We've heard a really, like, shallow exposition of, of, of Morgenthau in particular. But... Oh, my God. What is Sunday's opinion on the constructivist theory? I think it's 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 more interesting than the realist theory by, by orders of magnitude. But I think the international relations angle is... is ill-conceived by itself.
like I, I think even operating within the international relations frame of references is is a mistake. But oh, I, I want to watch literally anything but this. We have forty five minutes and left. Ignore oh the no! Suffering you endured throughout your history, demean and belittle those who resisted your oppression. Like, why are we even talking about Chomsky if it's as a critique of realism? What's the point? Chomsky's not a realist. Chomsky's Chomsky's a linguist turned pundit. He's not a he's not a realist in international relations theory. And in the end ask, but what about something something South America? Because you Eastern Europeans are irrelevant brats who are just ungrateful for what the benevolent Soviet Union did for you. If you are European like myself, you probably just know that this is something that you should just not say. Saying something like this to Czechs or Slovaks is just insulting, demeaning, offensive, and an immoral revisionist assault on their identity and self-understanding through their history. Most of us here in Europe know that 30,000 Czechs were murdered under a Soviet occupation, that thousands more were arrested. We know what the Prague Spring was, and how traumatic the Prague Spring and the period of Soviet occupation was for the Czechs. Saying something like what Chomsky said is just out of touch, tone deaf, and offensive. And I think that this is the key to understanding people like him. What people like Chomsky say here, or Corbyn, when he keeps referring to Ukraine as the Ukraine, as if it were still a Russian imperial subject, may remind European viewers of something else. German viewers may be reminded of a certain type of old German who during conversations about the Second World War says things like, well, at least Hitler built the Autobahn, or well, the Poles also did bad things to us, yeah, and try to misrepresent the Second World War as a war of Polish aggression against a supposedly benevolent Nazi Germany. Or French viewers may be reminded of a certain type of old Frenchman who rambles about how the Algerians are just supposedly ungrateful people who do not appreciate all the great benevolent things the French did for them when thousands of Algerians were burnt alive in their villages by French napalm bombs. And British viewers may be more familiar with a type of old Brit rambling about the ungrateful Indians who do not appreciate that Britain brought them civilization through famines or something. I believe it is more helpful to understand people like Chomsky, Corbyn and Melanchon by comparing them to people like that. Western Marxists had a vested interest in the continuation of the Soviet bloc as an ideological competitor to the Western bloc. They believed that the revolution may still come to the West and that the communist bloc may help facilitate such. But then the Eastern Europeans dashed these dreams when they did a revolution ironically against communism, which was supposed to be impossible. Many Western Marxists. What does this have to do with realism? Kraut, like our time is valuable. Come on. This, why is this an hour and a half long? A critique of realism could take 15 minutes, target some underlying assumption of realist modes of analysis, and show why it's fraught or presume something that you can't sustain very easily. Bada bing, bada boom. That's all you gotta do have never forgiven Eastern Europeans for ending communist tyranny in Europe. I think some Eastern Europeans may not even be aware of that. Your history, your struggles, okay, hang cultural on. identity... I need, I, need, I need to put a poll in chat. This is important, okay? Can I take... Wait, no, that's a QA. and I want a poll. A poll. Should I take a grilled cheese break? Oh, God. This is awful. Your political developments, those are all irrelevant to many Western You know, look, Marx. look. Haas blesses his rotten little heart. He has, the, he has the decency to be entertaining. This is pain. Oh, my God. Most of them don't even speak a single one of your languages. The only thing that matters to them is that you committed that cardinal sin in 1989. To them, you are just traitors and ungrateful brats. It is for these reasons that this segment of this video is so short. I know that some of you specifically asked me to critique Marxists who are throwing around realist talking points since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I will not do that. I will argue against the realism of Mersheimer and Morgenthau because those are genuine realists. I do not believe for a single second that people like Chomsky, Corbyn or Melanchon are genuine realists. Realist talking points to and them. And why are we talking about them? Kraut, this video is titled The Critique of Realism. If they aren't realists, 
why are we talking about them? I don't think anybody like counts Chomsky and Corbin as like like examples of political realists. They're like wishy-washy. Are just temporary rhetorical devices used in a disingenuous way. They are not motivated out of any genuine political principle or theory, but out of a spiteful grudge held against the peoples of Eastern Europe. The only what? thing that I would have to say to an old British person who claims that Indians do not appreciate what the British Empire... He thinks Corbyn is a spiteful grudge against Eastern Europeans? Why? ...supposedly did for them, is that the British Empire is dead, and that is a good thing. Now get over it, Grandpa. Hey, look, look, look. And in that well, look, look, look. Make this a five-minute video that I don't need to watch called Fuck Chomsky, okay? This is not a critique of realism. This is false advertising. You have bamboozled me. You dangled Morgenthau in front of me like a like dangling keys over a baby, and then you, you led me down this rabbit hole. Thing. The only thing you should say to a Chomsky or a Corbyn is that the Soviet Union is... Oh, hey, Demon Mama, this is horrible. This is horrible. I could cry. ...dead. And that is a good thing. Now get over it, Grandpa. So, before I end this segment and go into my critiques of realism, I kind of want to end this segment by quoting someone. Alexander Vondra. He was a Czech dissident during the Soviet occupation of Czechoslovakia, a leader of the Velvet Hi. Revolution, a Czech diplomat who spearheaded the process of historical reconciliation and agreements of future friendship between Poland and Czechia, and is currently a Czech representative in the European Parliament. When Chomsky called people like him cowards in 2014, Alexander Vondra responded with the following. I cannot understand how anybody can respect the reasoning of this poor man in our country in particular. During the same days when Václav Havel was serving time in a communist prison cell because he advocated for basic democratic values, Chomsky was sitting around Boston cafes, penning articles in full support of Pol Pot's genocide in Cambodia. If the world continues to listen to the bullshitting of such people with an intellectual admiration, we will once again end up in gulags and concentration camps. Now, the next segment are my critiques of realism. Oh, First, thank God. The Ayatollah disapproves. Oh, my God. Okay. Ayatollah the Ayatollah disapproves. But you do not. You, dear viewer, you have voted in favor of me taking a grilled cheese break, and I shall. We will be back in about 15 minutes, and we will get finally into the critique of realism. 51 fucking minutes into this dreck. Oh, my God. Ugh. All right. I'm going to run ads right now. Boom. And I'm going to be back in about 15 with a Sengi. Take care. No, don't take care. Stay there. Come back. 15 minutes. We are finally getting into the critique of realism. We have to finish this. We've come too far.
Thank you for your patience. Back at the spot. Now we can continue. I have I have had grilled cheese and it was fantastic. And by the way, if you ever make grilled cheese, first of all, use mayo, not butter. You will thank me. Just make sure medium heat. Make sure the cheese is on the bread as soon as you start grilling. Grill the inside first so the cheese melts faster. And uh, make sure you dip it in a cayenne hot sauce. At least that's my strong recommendation. As we were, we are finally, it's taken us 51 minutes, and we, he's just been all over the map, just, like, quite literally. We've, we've talked about Reagan, we've talked about Chomsky, we've talked about Mearsheimer, uh, we haven't really talked about Mearsheimer at all, actually, it's been sort of loosely mentioned. His entire point of contact for realism is just Morgenthau by himself, and it's like, we haven't had a critique of realism yet. We're, we're more than halfway through. We're not even set up for a critique of realism. It's just been random. Anyhow. Let's continue. The Khomeini's Iranian revolution and the resistance against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan were challenges to the bipolar Cold War order that left both sides and their Cold War rationales blindsided. Here, a political system emerged that wished to side with neither participants in the supposed global game of poker. But Islamism also refused to play poker and deliberately played by its own rules outside what? of the framework of realism. In other words, it was neither a poker chip nor a poker player. It was completely outside of the rationale. Confusing? Let me explain. Realism is pretty. No, what's confusing is that your categories are fraught. Islamism isn't a category of thing. That's like an outsider's perspective on the spread of an ideology that has no internal consistency because you're grouping in a bunch of disparate elements in that like islamism includes revolutionaries in iran it includes members of the muslim brotherhood it includes sunni shias it includes uh, like who, who the hell are you even talking about at this point it's like the word progressive it has only a negative value from the vantage of of a uh, of a person whose only concern is the eradication of all of these all, all agents of this flavor, Islamism suffices. But for an actual description of like politics at any level of analysis, it's it's worthless. It's it's actually worthless. Here, important question in chat. Very important question. All will be held to account at the end of days. Previously explained is a theory built on the idea of conflict through the striving for power between nation states. But the political forces unleashed by Iran, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, and then further spread throughout various movements and religious sects are forces to whom the nation state does not matter. Islamism, a modern incarnation of political Islam, is a set of beliefs and system of political organization and institutions that completely disregards the nation state. It is a system of social organization and political power that seamlessly crosses modern sovereign borders with no regard for any boundaries set by nation states and any rules of engagement between nation states. It is a system of politics that exists outside of the concept of the nation state and can therefore effortlessly operate from outside of the nation state's constraints. To this very day, no foreign policy theory of engagement by anyone has found a way to effectively confront Islamism as a political force. The main reason is that Islamism is based on ideas and not just a striving for power. To counter ideas, you must confront them with opposing ideas. Additionally, realism a theory built on a foundation of conflict between nation-states is utterly useless in confronting political institutions like Islamism which do not rely on and are not built upon the concept of the nation-state. When confronted with Islamism, realism has helped bring forth some weird curiosities. That's not really true though. Like if you actually look into the political philosophy of Ayatollah Khomeini who was revolutionary and very modern, he actually does presume the nation-state in a lot of his thinking conceptually. I'll go into that at some point in the future, but this is just this is just reductive. It's born out of a total contempt for these groups, as if they're they're like out of the medieval times or something. American foreign policy. Does Kraut make new videos? Does he just remix opinions about things he dislikes? It feels like that sometimes. Like, I don't I don't get it. He's been around forever, but it's it's so lazy. It's simultaneously too much work to say too little. 
country, such as its alliance with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, theocracies that from the realist perspective may be an American ally, but also actively work on undermining and attacking the American sphere of influence through means that are not bound to nation-state concepts of power games, and therefore cannot be confronted or oh, hey, contained Brooks. by the strategies and policies of realism. Islamism spreads and builds upon a... Yeah, I don't know. I... Maybe he read the Al-Qaeda reader or something? I, I don't know. But even then, like, I don't know how you would get this from that. Like, Islamists are super modern. Super, super modern. At least the people who he would call Islamists. The foundation of an immaterial belief in a god and his supposed cause. Because it is based on faith, Islamism in political terms transcends the nation state. No, it fucking doesn't. And what do you mean it's ba what do you mean it's based on faith? What is that referring to exactly? I mean, let's let's play this out for a second. W what are you even referring to when you're referring to like disparate groups of competing entities as Islamists as if they're all part of one thing? What actually binds them together? Islam isn't a description of a community. Islam is a description of a relationship to God. Yet you're invoking this as as a as a categorization scheme from the outside when they disagree whether or not these competing groups are themselves true true Muslims. What are, I don't know what we're what we are doing is we are we are uh, exemplifying the fallacy of sunk costs. Um, we have watched fifty three minutes of this. We must now watch the rest. That's just the way it is. Nation-state concepts of power, such as professional armies, diplomatic rules of engagement, military rules of engagement, or commercial treaties, do not matter. The Islamist yes, they movement do. can they randomly have, they have those things. power from outside of the confines of nation-states, from various different national and cultural backgrounds, and make moves that violate any and all diplomatic norms. It can set up its base in any power vacuum, and also does not care about the rules of engagement between nation-state concepts. Modern Islamism proves that ideologies matter. We do not just strive for raw power and for the exercising of that raw power. No, people strive to act out what they genuinely believe, and Islamism also proves that the nation-state is not the sole force of politics in our modern world. Second, the self-fulfilling prophecy. To most of you who have watched my previous videos, the fact that I am a critic of realism is probably not surprising. I am largely an adherent of institutional economics. I believe I've... that the most deciding factor in political development are institutions, ergo the internal political developments of societies. In... God. Institutional economics is about the study of. It was three years ago. Kraut talked to Vosh, and he got lost in talking about Islam. Did he really? I wonder if that'd be worth looking at. Let me try and find that. Actually, I'm kind of curious. Vosh Kraut. Chatting with Kraut, departing Vosh, online politics, and more. This is an hour-long con- Oh, it's on Destiny. No, no. Talking with Kraut, Muslim immigration and ideology. Oh, this is an old one. Let's take a look. I'm mildly curious. This is when Vosh was yelly. My friends. My beautiful friends, my comrades, my compatriots in these trying times. Let's get it started. Let's get it fucking started, okay? I'd introduce him, but he needs no introduction. The man, the myth, the legend himself. I click the start voice call button. Hey, man. Hey! I completely fucking screwed up the, the time sense. Completely. What time did you um, think we were talking? I thought we were going to talk about three hours from now, two hours from now. 
uh, I had a pizza in the oven. I don't know if you know the the Scotland England game just kicked off. No, I, I, have, well. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't I don't concern myself with your pre with your petty ball kick trifles. I, I, we deal with real <laughs> American issues here, kick. like ball kick, but with 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 tapered. Ball. This is the first time first time Scotland and England play against each other in the World Cup. So what is that? Yeah, is it because of? <laughs> Is it like in the spirit of Brexit too? Like the Scots are really fucking mad with what's going on right now? No, no. I, it's just it's just interesting to watch. Also because it's it's the women's World Cup, so nobody knows which team is going to be the better one because it's a sport that has only recently been growing in popularity. Because literally nobody yeah, cares I, when women do things. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't say that anymore. I think it's growing in popularity. Like I'm watching it. I'm watching it because it's England's versus scotland which makes it interesting i just remember More interesting. like 10 years ago when the only time i heard people talk about women's sports was volleyball because they wear ridiculously skimpy outfits and beyond <laughs> that nobody gave a fuck so i guess it's nice that people are paying attention now oh i watched the final four years ago of the women's world cup and it was genuinely one of the the best finals ever played hell yeah so, that's what i'm fucking yeah. saying those femoids fucking it up i love it um all right we can't delay. We can't delay for a moment longer, Kraut. I'm gonna need you. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna introduce you. All right? That's my. That's just such We're a normal thing. It's just such a. Oh, I see. Thing. Okay, you cringe at the concept, not at me using the yeah. term. No, well, I agree. No, no, no don't cringe at me. Yeah, right. I mean, the um, mm. and, and and not and by the way, not that it matters to them. Nazis will gladly conflate ethnicity with race, with national origin, with culture. They all mean the exact same thing to them. They just see whites. It is white people. And then from underneath that umbrella, you have everything that comes intrinsically with being white. Being of national origin somewhere in Western Europe, America, Canada, or Australia, or New Zealand, if you're being real but spicy. If you, if you and... want to give me to give you my definition, my, my reasoning for why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? You might be doing this because you believe that fascism is on the rise and a legitimate threat to our democratic societies. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure, fascism in its form, how it is, you know, it is a legitimate threat to a democratic society. Nobody can deny it. I mean, the very ideology is built upon a rejection of democratic principle and humanistic principle. But um, I, I just disagree with you on the point that I don't believe that fascists movements offline in real life are popular enough to pose a legitimate challenge to democratic societies at this point uh I, reason... would, I would sincerely disagree with that point what country do you live yeah. in Could you we, we disagree with we we disagree on that but the reason why i'm doing what i'm doing is because it's a contrarian thing to do in the current online environment i mean that's fair, the reason why I'm doing but the i mean right wing Right-wing culture is currently the single most popular online culture. It's it's domineering online culture. It's domineering internet culture. And I believe that one of the biggest defenses of freedom of speech, for example, is to be a contrarian, to deliberately go after what is popular. Would you say then that if people like me were the predominant voice that you would be comfortable repping fascists? No. Why Why does opposing something always automatically mean to some people that you have to embrace every other aspect of society that might in some conceivable way be opposed? Because if you're a public figure, if you make videos targeting one side of the political aisle, you're going to attract people mm -hmm. from the other side. I know that when oh, I that's make videos true. shitting that's on true. fascists, I'm not even arguing... if... Even if I never I'm make an arguing. argument for leftist or Marxian economics, I will attract leftists and Marxists. But am I automatically arguing their case? No, but I would say that you are That's implicitly the bolstering their position by attacking their own. All right, this is boring. Back on the critique of realism. ...of laws, social contracts, and economic structures of the past and present societies to develop policies to improve societies based on what is proven to work through observation and examination. Anyone who studies the development of institutions and believes that there is such a thing as political development by either progress or regression through policy will inevitably come into conflict with the schools of thought spawned by the crisis of modernity. And that includes realism. My biggest gripe with...
Okay, realism is downstream from American political science that emphasizes the American style state. American European style state fetishizes it and, and treats it as the single unit because that's all America recognizes in its foreign policy at the time. That's that's what it is. It is not responding to a crisis of modernity. And that's not what crisis of modernity refers to. Oh my god. Realism is that to the realist, internal developments do not matter and are irrelevant. That's not it is true. very tempting to adopt offensive realism when looking at the world of geopolitics. No, 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 to no, no, see no. the world like a nation. No, no, no. Uh, internal developments do matter, but they... Developments take place within a state does not, for a realist, obviate or eliminate the uh, international state of anarchy between states. That's that's the point. There's, again, an, an, a hyperemphasis on state sovereignty in a way that just doesn't actually make sense when you examine it carefully. That's that's the issue. Um, like, the, the, the space between states is timeless. Time exists as, like, a, 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 an internal uh, quality of states. Development takes place within states. There is no development outside of states. That is eternal. So you have um, you have a partitioning of, of time zones, I guess, in which within states conceptually there is time, there is development, there are processes. But out between states, there there are not. There are simply um, agents in a situation of stasis, making strategic uh, judgments against each other. But it but war never changes. That you know building strategy video game. The idea that one can base foreign policy on hard-boiled, rational, and almost mathematical calculations on predictive models built on observed behaviors as most modern economists do. Doing so provides a sense of certainty and security. But the way realists boil down politics to nothing more than analyzing power dynamics reminds me of something else. In economics, there is a phenomenon called physics envy. This is when economists pursued the goal of boiling the study of economic success or failure down to hard-boiled rational calculations with predictive power that mimic the predictive power of theories in the natural sciences and ultimately fail. Crafting such models provides a sense of security, but it is ultimately a false sense of security. Numerous economic theories have been built in attempts to create rational mathematical formulas or behavioral models for economic success which, however, ignored an incalculable or overlooked social factor and therefore failed to predict an economic crash. To ignore internal social, cultural and political developments, as realists demand one does, is certain to, and has in the past, ignored enormous social variables that completely disrupt the equation. One of oh. the most glaring things about the previous example of the emergence of Islam... I'm seeing the results in my poll and I'm deeply ashamed of all of you. I thought better of you. As I thought better of my force, audience. Is that realism was entirely unable to predict it. Not because of... Wait. Oh, the new Last of Us episode. I was all excited. I thought The Last of Us came out on Steam finally. Actually, let me see. Has it yet? I don't think it has. I actually haven't played The Last of Us. But I really want to. Ah, not till March. One month. Oh, but it's the same month as the Resident Evil 4 remake. Oh a miscalculation for the use of the formula or the pursuit of power among nation states but because the formula itself is flawed because it fails to account for internal development internal political development be it cultural political demographic geographic technological or other is one of the most deciding factors in understanding geopolitical developments okay. and many conflicts no. which realists would like to explain away as no a that's wrong look okay realism is a conceptual framework is fraught but realists themselves aren't stupid they understand that internal developments technological cultural etc etc things that impact decision making tendencies and ability those matter obviously they are determiners of, of what states decide to do and what states conceive as their own interest they understand this they aren't dumb but he just he doesn't understand the people he's talking about probably because he's read a cliff notes of morgenthau and that's his entire frame of reference for what realists do i can't believe i have to defend realists here 
it's a mere pursuit of power by nation states, are in fact the result of internal developments. One of the pre-Cold War statesmen, much admired by realists, is Metternich, the foreign minister and de facto ruler of the Habsburg Empire during and after the Napoleonic era. Through a hard-boiled calculated application of power politics, Metternich managed to become the most powerful statesman in Europe and secure a balance of powers in post-Napoleonic Europe. But from Metternich also comes his famous quote, You can do many things with a bayonet, but you cannot sit on it. Metternich presided over a police state that attempted to crush and subdue any revolutionary nationalist political sentiment, which happened to be the preeminent force of internal political development of that age. And to do so, he needed a bayonet, which was his police state. But he could never sit on that bayonet. His police state had to continuously subdue internal political developments expressed through the desires of the German people to have a unified nation state and the various ethnic groups of the empire to have their own nation states. These political developments kept boiling beneath Metternich's bayonet like under a pressure cooker until they finally blew up in 1848, a year of Europe-wide nationalist revolutions known as the Spring of Nations. The Spring of Nations, in return, spawned numerous conflicts, most prominent among which are the German Wars for Unification with Austria, Denmark and France, the Balkan Wars for Independence, Balkan Nationalist Wars over Territory, a Hungarian Uprising, several Polish Uprisings, the Italian Resorgimento, or Wars for Unification, and they may have also contributed to Arab uprisings against the Ottoman Empire. I would argue that the realist claim of the world inherently being a place of inevitable conflict is in some ways merely a self-fulfilling prophecy in a circular logic that spawns that conflict through its own policies. By ignoring or even subduing internal political development in favor of seeking a balance of powers on a global stage, it enforces a social stagnation that hinders political development, thereby leaving the demand for political development to boil like under a pressure cooker, to later explode, to create the very world of conflict that realists insist isn't caused by the process of internal political development that they so deem as irrelevant. Third, the death of communism. <laughs> I bet most realists are sick and tired of this one, but I had to bring no, this I one am. up. I'm sorry. But yeah, the, the era of offensive realism being the predominant force of American foreign policy ended when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War came to an end. Ever since, realism has mostly been confined to being mainly an academic topic of discussion in the field of international politics and in political science. And many realists today put a lot of effort into rebuilding the credibility they lost when the Berlin Wall came crashing down. This is because the collapse of the Soviet Union disproved the core tenet of the realist theory, namely that conflict was an inevitability and that the world would continuously find itself oh my in a God. state of game of power between leading nation states. I know what's going no. on. Oh, I know what he's doing. He's just... Oh. This has just been Fukuyama the entire way through. That's all this is. He's, he's taken Fukuyama as his Bible. Remember Kissinger's justification for his foreign policy, that the United States would find itself in a conflict with the Soviet Union for centuries to come and therefore had to enforce the balance of powers. That was proven false. Previously, I pointed out that ideologies matter. This point is reiterated here through the striving of the various peoples of Eastern Europe to be liberated from the tyranny of communism. But it also shows that the failures of ideologies matters and that in some ways, the failure of empires and the failure of imperialism matters. The way communism died, collapsing on its internal contradictions by being unable to provide a decent living standard or even just basic dignity to its peoples, on a socio-economic system that was pretty much in decline since the 1970s, showed that nothing about a possible end of communism was an illusion, but in fact something that was desirable and very much achievable. In the end, the idea that the Soviet Union would continue as a geopolitical threat for centuries was the actual illusion. What followed the collapse of the Soviet Union in Europe was an unprecedented era of democratization, peace and stability. An era in which European nations were able to engage in political development outside of their role of being supposedly American poker chips. And the only reason why we are seeing a return of war to Europe right now is because Russia wants to turn Europe into poker chips and not because Europe is a bunch of poker chips.
The Europeans created the European Union, an institution whose existence is meant to destroy the balance of power games that has drawn this continent into so many catastrophic wars. Rather than striving for spheres of influence and balances of power, European nation states are encouraged to reconcile, overcome historic enmities and cooperate. A process successful between Germany and France, Germany and Poland, Germany and the Netherlands, Poland and Ukraine, Italy and Greece, Greece and Bulgaria, Czechia and Poland. Many American realists either pretend the European Union does not exist, argue for its dissolution, or predict its imminent collapse and return to a Cold War era American sphere of influence. There's a good reason for this. The idea of a national corporation between... Okay, but here's the real question. Is the Dead Space remake worth it? The Dead Space remake is so worth it. I was... It's so weird. I originally thought that the Dead Space remake was going to be like a soulless just graphical update on the original no they've added so much the mechanics are better the atmosphere is different not better but really good in a different way and it's it's good by itself it doesn't replace the original game but it is also an improvement of sorts there's so much more to it in terms of plot the game plays better the combat feels better um i thought the callisto protocol was going to be the one that like you know advanced the formula but it, it didn't it was it was a it was a backward step. Um, no, uh, the, the Dead Space remake is fantastic. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a very much a different game from the original. Between the poker chips, outside of a sphere of influence, tears the realist idea of a great poker game of power to shreds. Cold War realists therefore often have contempt for transnational organizations like the European Union, Mercosur, ASEAN, or the African Union. To many Europeans, the political lessons learned from the end of the Cold War is that geopolitical power systems or spheres of influence and great power are something to oppose and dismantle. And to those who cannot make sense of geopolitics without these, this idea is often something they just can't get over. Ironically, the realist reaction to the collapse of the Soviet Union was to propose a continuation of realist foreign policy by artificially continuing the potential for conflict conflict between nations and great powers. Some of those proposals were just outright bizarre to say the least, such as a proposal to artificially oh, prop up and continue the Warsaw Pact to ensure two different competing geopolitical power blocks in Europe who could then continue to vie for power in Europe and thereby create an artificial balance of powers in Europe between East and West. Basically, a demand to create a potential for conflict and war in Europe, not for any real ideological purpose, but just so that the game of power can con What's going on here? It's like slowing down. continue forever, no matter the cost. Or a really bizarre proposal by John Mersheimer in 1990 to give an arsenal of nuclear weapons to a unified Germany to create an artificial balance of power between new European nuclear powers. Yes, uh, this was actually proposed. This is not a joke. He actually proposed this. Uh, basically to recreate the geopolitical environment that led to the First World War but with nuclear <laughs> weapons and promising that it won't lead to war because there's nuclear weapons. Oh, God. Well, n not one realist assumed that European democratization and integration as a process for peace and stability in Europe could actually work. But so far, that process of European integration has proven them wrong. Realism is a foreign policy doctrine of the past. It served in ages of empires and the Cold War, continuing a realist foreign policy. After no, no, it didn't. It didn't serve at all. Oh my god, this is so bad. Cold War in a post-imperial age would be like for a patient to continue taking addictive painkillers long after the patient has already recovered from a painful injury. I haven't yet. Fourth, the Empire's missing clothes. This is a point that sort of is an addition to the previous point. Something that is often overlooked today is that the Soviet Union was an empire and that there's important insights to gain from viewing its history as the history of an empire. All empires are built on lies. No, the Soviet Union... Oh my god, the Soviet Union wasn't an empire. It inherited imperially gained territories, but the Soviet Union as a political form was not imperial. It was a single political entity that was a federation of, like, sub-republics or something. It wasn't... It was not an empire. An empire is not just a big place with diverse denizens inside of it. That's not what that means. 
Empire refers to a hegemonic relationship between like a, a center and other uh, like like cities or, or states or whatever that pay tribute and have like a subordinate relationship to that center. That's not what happened in the Soviet Union. And I am not just saying this is some wishy-washy rhetorical device. Empires are built on political fictions, and it is the preservation of these fictions that serve as the justification for empire that all empires invest in. No empire can give you a satisfactory answer to a very simple question. Why? As in, why are you an empire? Or what, to be more precise... No, they can. Hey... We've got the legions behind us. You can't. You will. You will pay tribute, or you will die. And if you join, then you will have uh, benefits. You will have rights as a member of the empire. Da, da, da. Your people can go to and fro. You can trade. You can benefit. It's good for both of us. And if you if you defy us, we'll kill you, replace your leadership, and then we'll make that deal with your successors. Why is easy? Um. He's waffling between like uh, propaganda justifying a state internally, and and an empire maintaining its hegemony uh, over over other states or political units. This is this is incoherent. Gives you the right to subjugate and rule over others. Examine the political foundations of almost all empires in history, <laughs> and you will never get any satisfactory answer. Oh, I love this. Okay. Oh, so I just just sh sh randomly I open up this uh, this log in Dead Space. <clears throat> It happened again, third time in the last, however long it's been. I came in after a shift and found Rousseau at the transmitter again. They looked like hell. I don't know if they'd even slept since the last time I caught them in here. Not very reassuring to see the most uh, eminent political contract theorist in liberal history in that state. I bring this up because even though some modern Marxists now repeat realist talking points, ironically the Marxists of the Cold War era had a really good point when they dismissed realism as little more than a thin veneer to disguise imperialism. The same question that you can ask from an empire, you can also ask from a realist. Why should there be great powers? Why should some nation states merely be poker chips? How do you decide who gets to be a great power? What are the factors that make a great power? Think of Vietnam. Yes, many realists protested the American war in Vietnam, but I believe that the mistake that even those realists made was to see Vietnam as little more than a poker chip that was played by great power poker players. To realists who opposed the Vietnam war, Vietnam was seen as a Chinese poker chip, and therefore they argued that the Americans have to pull out and leave this poker chip for China. But right after the Americans left Vietnam, China invaded Vietnam because Vietnam refused to be a Chinese poker chip. Our country is really poker chips. As we have seen in almost all earlier examples, as much as you may like to assume that some countries are merely poker chips in a game of great powers, almost all countries will universally refuse to be poker chips. And this goes as far back as the Malian dialogue. From the Malians to the Vietnamese, throughout history, idealism consistently persists, despite the ambitions of power of those that disregard idealism. Most claims to great power today are built either on claims of ideology or on claims of history. The United States claimed to be the great power of democracy and almost instantly drove that claim into an Iraqi ditch. What possible humanitarian or geopolitical reason could there still be to continue the blockade of Cuba? It is in our day and age really just an unnecessary cruelty. The Chinese claim to be the great power with influence over much of Southeast Asia is based on a bunch of century-old maps. As if nobody else has ever drawn maps before. Some of the most prolific cartographers of the past were medieval Moroccans. So by the standards of China, Morocco has a historical right to rule the entire Mediterranean. The Chinese stories of history of fraternal peoples with Uyghurs and Tibetans is just as much of a President Sunday, do you think Kraut thinks of the post-World War II USSR as an empire to the Politburo using other Soviet republics as buffer zones and maintaining them by quashing rebellions? I have no idea. I think, I honestly think he just thinks of an empire as being any modern nation state of size. I think he just refers to states of scale. So the United States, that's an empire. Why? Because it's really, really big. Russia, it's really, really big. I mean, you can't seriously be thinking it's an empire by reference to 
um it's hegemonic control over like places in the middle east or whatever or it putting like dictators in power um because he doesn't make that distinction he doesn't refer to the USSR in Afghanistan. He just talks about the USSR being an empire by default, as if that's its constitution. So it just doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Superpower equals empire in Kraut's mind. Seems to be, anyways. He defined empire in the previous video. Oh, I don't care. Hollow fiction as Habsburg fictions of fraternity with the Czech people. You and then need there's to, Russia. Look, Russia is an empire. Look, you you kind of need to earn the right to make up your own definitions, okay? Especially, like, for terms that have common use already. A state. That being a nation state that attempts to preserve the borders of an empire. And it does so during a time and in a region of dead empires. Russia's claim to spheres of influence in Eastern Europe are in part built on fictions of fraternal peoples that are just as hollow as other fictions of fraternal peoples, but by and large Russia claims that history is the judge that decreed Russia to be a great power. Well, what does history tell us about great powers in Eastern Europe? Turn back the clock 200 years and the predominant great power game for Eastern European power struggles was actually a game of power between Germany, Austria and Russia. Turn back the clock another 100 years and the predominant power in Eastern Europe was Poland. So maybe Russia should bow before its historically legitimate overlords in Warsaw. Turn back the clock another 100 years and Sweden was a great power of Eastern Europe, vying for power with Poland. Turn back the clock another 100 years Years, and the Ottomans were the great power trying to cement their claim over Eastern Europe. Turn the clock back another 200 years at the predominant power of Eastern Europe were the Duchy of Lithuania and the Mongol Golden Horde. Another 200 years and you end up with the Kievan Rus, which is the ancestral state of modern Slavic culture. And if you were to even go further back from there, you end up with Huns, who were also Turkic, then the Goths, who were Germanic, and eventually the Sarmatians and Scythians, who are ancestral peoples of the modern Iranians. If history really is the judge here, then the Iranians have just as much of a legitimate claim than anyone else. Although the Soviet Union was the only imperial entity to unify the entirety of Eastern Europe, it only lasted 70 years, and Russia, or the lands we know as its western core, was throughout much of history a bunch of isolated backwaters, border fortresses and outposts from where the Kievan Rus, Vikings and Poles bought the pelts that they sold to the Ottomans. Moscovy started out as a small fortress ruled by a robber baron. A robber baron, by the way, is not an insult and it is not meant here in the 19th century definition of an industrial oligarch, but a historical term for a type of feudal lord of the Middle Ages. Feudal lords who did not rule over any valuable resources tended to raid the lands of their neighboring lords or extract tribute from them by threatening violence. And the Prince of Moscovy, who basically ruled oh, over a small like backwater that. fortress in a swamp. Okay, sorry, this is much more interesting. So they actually, on, on the subject of whether or not the Dead Space remake is better than the original, in the original Dead Space, um, the Leviathan and the thing on the outside of the ship on the antenna rays, those are different necromorphs. One is called the Slug, and one is the Leviathan, and you just kill the Leviathan in, in food storage, and it just hangs there. But in the remake, you launch it out into space. That's how you kill it, which makes a lot of sense. And then, but the question always was like, well, where did this giant necromorph come from? How did it get this kind of biomass if it's out there in space? Was it just always floating around? And they have an explanation now. The Leviathan was jettisoned into space. It wasn't dead, and it latched onto the outside of the ship. That's actually a really clever way to sort of square that circle. Womp was such a robber baron. Any historian will tell you that using a superficial reading of history as a foundational claim of modern political power is a bad idea. It will always lead you to places that prove you wrong. Oh, By standards of historical claims, now. Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, Austria, Germany, Mongolia, Turkey, and also Sweden all have just as legitimate a claim to being the predominant power of Eastern Europe because all of them engaged in policies of conquest and the expansion of spheres of influence to attain that status of empire. History is not a standard by which one can justify claims to empire. History is full of empires that faded into nothing. If history teaches us anything in regard to empire, it is that empire dies. There's a Chechen proverb which claims that the mountains of the Caucasus are white because they are built from the bones of Persians, Greeks, Romans, Goths, Huns, Sarmatians, Arabs, Tatars, Mongols, Turks, and Russians. 
And it is because of that recorded history of rising and falling empires and all the suffering and misery that came with it that Europe no longer wishes to have any empires or any great powers. But most importantly, it is also why Europe no longer wishes to have any wars. I believe many who are not from Europe often fail to understand this point. The creation of the European Union, the idea of a European corporation, then competition, is meant as a process to overcome a history of European empires and to build something new in its stead that provides a sharing of resources without having to forcefully construct any spheres of influence. It is precisely for this reason that everyone in Europe, including those outside of the European Union, object and stand in opposition to Russia Russia's invasion of a European country. This is a continent drenched in centuries of blood and nobody here wants to see a return to European bloodshed. Many non-Europeans were surprised by the eagerness with which many Europeans rallied behind Ukraine. We usually tend to be far less hawkish, so it does not surprise me that this hawkish European response to Russia may surprise a lot of North Americans, South Americans, Asians and Africans. A big reason for a visceral reaction to Russia's invasion is because Russia opened up the specter of something we believe to be long gone and the horror of a distant past, the prospect of a return of European empires. Fifth, the curse of Bismarck. The way I was introduced to realism was ironically through Bismarck. Realists admire Bismarck, and this is something that strikes me as a bit of weird. There's a modern phenomenon, in particular among English speakers, to idolize Bismarck. You may have seen YouTube videos by history YouTubers from the UK or North America who uncritically idolize Bismarck, or you may have even read English-speaking historians who write of him with a degree of praise. This is weird to me and curious because in Germany, the exact opposite is happening. German historians used to write in glowing praise of Bismarck right up to the 1980s. But the common consensus among German-speaking <laughs> historians today is that Bismarck was a disaster for us. The consequences of Bismarck have been a catastrophe for Germany, for Europe, and for the world. And I agree with this assessment. Bismarck. This is which is why this video is called a critique of Bismarck, not a critique of realism. He hasn't critiqued realism here at all, really. Mark violently ended a German political tradition of negotiation, compromise, and regional autonomy. In its stead, he forced an authoritarian Prussian militarism and its militaristic institutions upon Germany as its political core foundation. His policies of discrimination against the Poles planted seeds for ever deeper resentments, and the foundational myth he created for a unified German state was one conditioned on a vengeful humiliation of France, built on a militaristic identity identity of the Germans as history's eternal enemies of the French people. I do not understand how realists separate Bismarck from Kaiser Wilhelm, or portray Kaiser Wilhelm as the man who ruined was Bismarck built, because the catastrophic decisions that Wilhelm made were enabled by Bismarck in the first place. Bismarck paved the road into the First World War that Kaiser Wilhelm then marched down. I know military historians have a special romantic image of Prussia, but Prussia was a disaster for everyone. I intend to eventually make a video on the political development of Germany, what? but just to spoil one thing... In Prussia was a... like, the the state was a disaster for everyone? What do, you, what do you mean? Like, the idea of Prussia? You understand, like, like Prussia was stamped down. Um... And that's that's why the communists didn't take any root there, right? Like, it, it wasn't... Oh, whatever. ...in advance. Look at the worst catastrophes that befell Europe over the last century. They all have their origins in Prussian militarism, in the Prussian political institutions, and in the Prussian striving, calculations, and politics of great power. The way realists separate Bismarck from Wilhelm with a simplified that is the good one and that is the bad one is just false. Historical developments tie and weave into each other. You can't just pick what you like and dislike as one would do at a salad bar. The selective realist interpretations of history are more often than not simply false. We already went through another realist idol, Metternich, and how Metternich's subduing of internal development points to another failure of realism. But there's something else too. Metternich's Congress of Vienna was supposed to enable a lasting peace in Europe through a balance of powers. Well, did it? 
The decades after the Vienna Congress were dominated by an Ottoman collapse and an aggressive Russian expansion into the former Ottoman Empire, we also saw the previously mentioned revolutions that occurred across Europe driven by internal political forces. We saw the Crimean War and its struggle over power and influence in Europe. There was a hyper-aggressive Prussia that went to war with almost all its neighbors and destroyed the faulty balance of powers that Metternich had created, only to replace it with another faulty balance of powers that led into another European catastrophe. Yeah, exactly. If Bismarck is to blame for the Kaiser, then Napoleon is to be blamed for Metternich. This is silly. Yeah, exactly, Noom of Tomorrow. This entire video is a salad bowl of historical pseudo-equivalencies. This is a... This is like something I would expect out of, like, What If Altus, just with a much more grating voice. Although this is getting there. This period of balance and peace realists claim existed is overblown and far more complex than they claim. And we often do not even mention how outside of Europe, it drove a brutal European colonial expansion and wars throughout the world, which many realists just pretend like they never happened. Realist calculations, though, were one of the main drivers of that colonialism, especially in Africa, where many participants wanted colonies not just for resources, but to undermine the power structures and ambitions of others. The okay, supposed that's technically correct. The balance of powers and peace in Europe just led to European power players taking out their Francis frustrations on unfortunate peoples outside of Europe. The system of power balance were exported to Africa through the Berlin Conference. They were not previously a part of Africa and were artificially established there through imperial power games by Europe over a power balance. Realists are guilty of something that every single person interpreting history, including myself, is guilty of. Selection bias. Anyone who does not admit to this is lying, by the way. And it is the main challenge of all of us who interpret history to be aware of this and to not ignore the historical events that challenge our narratives of interpretation. These were my points of criticism on realism. Feel free to voice your disagreements in the comments. And now at the end of this video, I'd like to share an alternative perspective on the origins of the war in Ukraine, the perspective of internal development. As mentioned before, I come from an almost completely opposing perspective to realism, so it probably does not come as a surprise to you that I disagree with it. Not only am I an idealist, but from my perspective, internal development is the most important factor in political development, and a determining factor also driving geopolitics. As such, I believe that this war was mainly driven by internal forces. When I look at Ukraine, I do not simply see a poker chip that merely exists to be played with by greater powers at their leisure, just as little as Vietnam or Afghanistan were poker chips. As much as you may wish to see Ukraine as just a poker chip, it will refuse to be such and consequently also refuse to be played as such in any hypothetical game of great powers. I do not believe that the origins of this conflict lie within notions of great power or spheres of influence. I believe the origins of this conflict lie within the internal, political and economic developments of institutions in a post-Soviet Europe. As such, I believe the story of this conflict begins with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the death of communism. The collapse of the Soviet bloc saw winners and losers. One of its winners was the Czech Republic. What sets Czechia apart from other former Eastern Bloc countries is that the 90s were dominated by a police crackdown on organized crime and white-collar crime. Czech viewers will probably know that Czechia was attempted to be used as a base by Russian organized crime to facilitate illegal business in Western Europe, most famously through the Russian mafia boss Semyon Moglevich, who previously operated in Budapest and tried to set up shop in Czechia after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. The Czechs, in response, cracked down on and expelled these crime syndicates. And this often overlooked policy measure had an enormous impact and separated the Czechs from other former Eastern Bloc countries because it prevented the establishment of an oligarchy gaining a Russian-style political influence through its wealth. These Czech anti-white-collar crime policies may have initially been intended to crack down on Russian organized crime, but were also in the end used to crack down on oligarchic structures in general. They therefore had the wider effect of purging Czech institutions of corruption. There are still some figures in Czechia that one could call oligarchs, or kind of oligarchs, such as Andrei Babiš, a Czech business owner who during the communist regime was a spy against anti-communist dissidents, and after communism built a business empire by acquiring a former communist agricultural and chemistry company, Agrofert. 
and from there expanded to become influential as a right-wing populist political figure. But compared to other Eastern European oligarchs, his power is very limited. He mainly went into politics to save himself and his wealth from ongoing corruption investigations into his various business dealings, rather than to acquire more power. The Czechs, then, without a post-Soviet oligarchy controlling the economy and influencing politics, set out to build open economic and political institutions and managed to build an economic structure that enabled educated professionals and independent entrepreneurs, while also building a functioning free representative republic that guarantees the liberties of its citizens with separation of powers under rule of law. Prague is seen today as one of the leading cities of the emerging European tech industry, rather than just some shabby corner of Eastern Europe. In fact, the Czechs are increasingly seen as a leading innovator of Europe, and have even overtaken Western European countries in modernization and development. In contrast, one of the post-Soviet collapse's biggest losers was Hungary. In Hungary, corruption and white-collar crime festered oh, deep into the economic state, thereby creating a system of clientistic favoritism in political institutions. The economy is run by a handful of oligarchs whose wealth is based not so much on entrepreneurship as on favoritism and backroom deals with the state. As an example, the aforementioned Russian mafia boss Simon Moglevich was able to continue his business in Budapest during the late 1990s after being unable to run his crime syndicate in Czechia. In Budapest, he ran human trafficking, illegal prostitution, and finance scam rackets until he had to leave Hungary due to getting the attention of the FBI. Accomplices of Moklevich, like Alexei Lugokov, were able to continue operating in Hungary after Moklevich was gone. The Hungarians built a functioning state after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but the callousness with which corruption was treated allowed for an oligarchy to be rejuvenated under the rule of Viktor Orban. The state is run by an autocrat who uses the oligarchy to gain far-ranging control of national media to disguise his undermining of independent civic institutions, a system that is only kept from collapsing by European Union subsidies, which the European Union is currently debating if it should cut down. As the leading example of this system, we can use Hungary's richest man, Lörink Mejarosz. He was a gas station fitter in the 2000s and went from that to being Hungary's richest man within just a few years. But this is not a romantic rags to riches story. Lorenk Mejaros is a high school friend of Viktor Orban, and that is the source of his wealth. When Orban became prime minister, Mejaros opened a construction company, and his construction company proceeded to receive state contracts for building bridges, stadiums, and other public infrastructure. Lorenk Mejaros is basically a state subsidized billionaire created purely for insipid nepotism. Among the winners and losers of the Soviet collapse, Russia and Ukraine both initially fell into the same loser traps. The Soviet-era industries were seized by ruthless and often criminal Soviet-era bureaucrats. This is pain. Oh, there's only seven minutes left. Let's just let it Who used these to create a clientistic system of favoritism with the state. Throughout the 90s, politics in both Ukraine and Russia was mainly the plaything of oligarchs. However, the big difference between Russian and Ukrainian political development is Putin. When Putin came to power, he managed to subdue the oligarchs in Russia and made these oligarchs subservient to the policies and demands of his newly reinforced, centralized, authoritarian Russian state. A system that is eerily similar to the Kremlinian system of Imperial Russia. But this development in the mid-2000s is where Russia and Ukraine also took different paths. What happened in Russia did not happen in Ukraine. In Ukraine, the Ukrainian wannabe Putins, Kuchma and his successor Viktor Yanukovych, failed at their attempts to subdue the oligarchy and build a centralized authoritarian state. Twice in 2004 and 10 years later in 2014. Interestingly, Yanukovych was prevented from doing so not by oligarchs but by the Ukrainian public who did not like the oligarchs but disliked the idea of a centralized authoritarian state even more. Because the establishment of a strongman authoritarianism failed in Ukraine, <laughs> there's a big contrast between the political development in Russia and Ukraine. In Russia, there was a conflict between the strongman and the oligarchy, which the oligarchy lost, while the Russian public does not really have much of a say in politics at all, because there is no politically enfranchised public in Russia. 
In contrast, in Ukraine, political development, especially since 2004, has been mainly marked by a conflict between an oligarchy and the general Ukrainian public, with the authoritarian strongmen increasingly eliminated from the picture. This is not to say that Ukraine is perfect, but there is a substantial difference in political development here. Ukraine developed a politically enfranchised public. Russia does not have a politically enfranchised public. The predominant internal political struggle of Ukraine is between the public and the oligarchy. The predominant internal political struggle of Russia is between the autocrat and the oligarchy. The Putin regime sometimes refers to Ukraine as an anti-Russia. And in many ways, this is actually correct. Especially if you rephrase it to Ukraine is an anti-Putin Russia. Both countries in political development made the same mistakes at the beginning of the post-Soviet era. But Russia ended up creating a strongman dictatorship, while Ukraine ended up with an enfranchised public. This is a thorn in the side of the Putin regime. I have no doubt that Putin pursues the conquest of Ukraine out of fantasies of empire as well. But I do believe that the political development of Ukraine also factors in. Because okay, this is interesting. It only took him an hour and 26 minutes. The last five minutes of this video is actually interesting. That's, that's, this is actually an interesting analysis. Oh my god, but what it took to get here. Ukraine, as it currently stands, is a window for Russians where they can see what life would be like in a country that is not governed under the Putin system. I'd like to end with a final note on political development in Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, some of us unfortunately like to look down at Eastern Europe. Oh, hey, Brooks. No, I agree with you, Brooks. place that this is part's... recovering from communism. This There's... last little bit, this last tiny little bit, this is good. It's the only it's the only part that's okay. Everything leading up to it and everything ensconcing it is terrible. But there's something there's a something interesting here. He must have like read some paper somewhere that had like some good analysis on this. Countries that supposedly have yet to learn to be like us in Western Europe. This is not true. In fact, I would argue that the opposite is true. Eastern Europeans are actually ahead of us in political development. Let me explain to you why I believe this. A core political struggle that we all, not just in Europe, but in democratic societies across the world, face is a confrontation between oligarchy and democracy. Neoliberal policies since the 1980s have generated huge wealth, but they also generated an enormous wealth inequality. Throughout the world's democracies, what we are increasingly seeing is the formation of small, wealthy oligarchies that increasingly challenge the political norms and institutions of liberal democracy. And Eastern Europe, well, they are ahead of us. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, an extreme neoliberal policy of shock therapy was placed upon much of the former communist bloc. In essence, to use a term from gaming, Eastern Europe did a speed run through the process of creating an oligarchy that we in the West are only just undergoing. The development into an extreme wealth inequality and the development of tying private wealth together with political power happened faster in Eastern Europe and in many ways Eastern Europe already underwent a development that we in the West are still to face. And once you realize this, then you will also realize that the politics of Eastern European countries is far more important than many assume at first. Figures like Putin, Yanukovych and Orban are a warning of what can happen when oligarchy wins that struggle. Eastern Europe is not a window into a backward past. It is a window into the political struggles of our future. We should ask ourselves, facing our own struggles in wealth inequality and oligarchy, if we wish to do something more along the lines of what the Czechs did, or end up like Russia under Putin, or do something entirely different. The very political struggle that caused this war, a struggle between oligarchs, strongmen, and the public in Ukraine and Russia, will be something that we could face too. Yanukovych is not some backward Eastern tyrant who could never happen in Western Europe. No, he is a challenge we will face in our future too. And to an extent, we already do. It is eerie to me how Yanukovych's campaign manager was also the campaign manager of Trump and basically imported a post-Soviet methodology of oligarchic power politics into American politics. The reasons for this war are not to be found in Cold War era assumptions of great powers. Because uh, oh, uh, the Discord link is down right now because we're locking down. We don't want to get flooded with DGG goons, so... Kraut did segment in this video where he thinks Western Marxists and leftists have resentment towards Eastern Europeans. Yeah, I saw that one. That's that's the uh, that's when he was talking about Chomsky and um, and uh, shoot, what's his name? 
Oh, I'm too tired. Because the future is not the past. The causes of this conflict lie in the recent past and present politics. Geopolitical conflicts are not spawned through lofty notions of international power games. In this case, they lie in the political developments that are a consequence of oligarchic challenges to public sovereignty. And if you ignore these internal developments and do not try to learn from them to avoid their consequences, you will doom yourself to facing that very conflict yourself at home. Thank you for watching this video. If you want to discuss this video with the community, do not f You should be paying me for this. Oh my god. Oh, Corbin, thank you. I wanted to say Orban, but that's not it. Obviously. I'm dead tired, guys. I got a call here. Um, tomorrow afternoon we have, uh, oh. We have ultimated, uh, what's his name? We have ultimated Judeo-Christian again. Yay. This is the, the promised, the promised rematch. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.